welcome friends to the hall. Huzzah! Cover decoder, <laughs> yes. The place where we sit with legendary figures and tell tales of creative glory. I am Inks. With me always is the weaver of yarns known as tapes and the yes. mixer of melodies known as bringineer. Beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, boop, beep. <laughs> Now, folks, we may have sailed away from Fantasy February, but we have found yes. some magic here yeah. in March. Because Fantasy tonight, February will always be inside of you. <laughs> always in your heart. That's right. And, and as we've approached the March shores, we've been greeted with a very special interview with David Peterson. The creator yes. of the Mouse yes. Guard and illustrator of incredible covers. Now, this is an extended interview, and we couldn't bring ourselves to break it up. So we're going to release it in its entirety. You're getting a it's, beast it's so, of episode. It's so All packed the flavor. Full. Mm, it's so packed full with mm, 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 delicious morsels of inspiration and insight and stories and because flavor you alert. can always flavor yes. alert, flavor alert, <laughs> flavor alert. Many, many Ooh. harvested mm. berries and nuts. Forged. So good. <laughs> he was incredibly generous with his time and with his knowledge. And you know, you can always hit that pause button until your boss leaves, and then pick back up with the magic. Also, before we begin, if you would like to follow along with the images we'll be discussing, you want to, folks. Yes, you want to follow. Yes, you want to follow, and you do that by going to CoverDecoder.com, and in the show notes, there will be a link to the slides we're going to be using in the interview. One last thing worth noting, this is our first non-explicit show, so if you're new and you like what you hear, please <laughs> <laughs> check out our other shows, but know that the language gets a little bit more colorful in those That's episodes. That's right. We well, decided to go pg <laughs> with this one well we couldn't help it the guy, you know david peterson's so wholesome it just happened you know we're proud that we you can actually listen to this one with your babies so now let's gather around the table mugs in hand and listen to the tales from the eloquent david peterson Huzzah! <laughs> Find yourself deep in a gargantuan forest, whose serene beauty masks horrors of immense size. But before being completely engulfed by terror, you are bolstered by the skill and experience of your guide, none other than David Peterson. Yes! <laughs> Woo! Well, first of Welcome all, this to is the incredible. Show, sir. Thank you for joining us tonight. We, Thanks for having me. Yeah, we are huge of fans of your your work. And um, before we start in on the meat of the the interview, the deep questions, we 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 have some warm up questions. Some might okay. say the important questions. Okay. Yes. And tapes is going to start us off. Yes, these are the secret steak bites that people want to know. So okay. the, the the first one here, what is one thing? That you must have when you illustrate, whether it be your your mouse guard patented slippers yes. or your pistachios. Uh, what is the item or thing that you need around you? Uh, I, I need something to drink. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and that could be something caffeinated or uh, just something wet. It, yeah. I'm, I'm actually trying <laughs> to wean myself off of... Uh, sodas and colas and stuff. So, uh, and and I can't do too much coffee, or I'll never get to bed. So, um, I'm I'm doing. Um, I got a soda stream for Christmas, and I've just been doing yes. oh, nice. just regular like carbonated water. Kind of satiates that that bubbly feeling that I would get from a soda. But uh, yeah, whether it's a Coke or just bubbly water or uh, or a coffee or a tea, that's uh, that's what I that's what you need. Yeah, you got to yeah. pound liquid. Yeah. We we ourselves are uh, hard seltzer boys. Oh, okay. Yeah. We are always drinking the bubbly stuff. So we are right. right there with you. Oh, yeah. Right you up. guys are fans I, of water. I am a polar a polar <laughs> aficionado. Oh, um, yeah. The finest the finest seltzer next to Waterloo, of That's course. That's right, right anyway. here. 
That's the poor man's <laughs> Waterloo. So, so you're, this, you're even going to kick Verner's? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Polar. We'll wear, we'll wear the polar bear suit. We'll wear your stuff. Yeah, hit us up, guys. <laughs> um, next question. What's your favorite anthropomorphic animal film? Favorite anthropomorphic animal film. We're thinking, you know, when the willows, yeah. all dogs go to heaven. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess they're not really anthropomorphic in that one. Teenage Mutant um, Ninja Turtles. You know, Secrets so of Nim. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think Ninja Turtles, that's, that's bending the rules a bit. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if it's not, it'd, it'd be the original live-action Ninja Turtles. But uh, yes. oh. I would probably go with, um, or you said animated, didn't you? That, that takes that out. Then. Well, you know. It could okay. be animated. Uh, I would take um, the Disney's Robin Hood. Yes! Oh, oh that is one of my yes. favorite That's films right, right there. Yeah, one of my favorite Walking Disney's. through the forest. Yeah. The, stop, yeah. the stop motion uh, Wind in the Willows done by Cosgrove Hall Yes, um, would probably be a close second. Yes. If, if we're talking animated and anthropomorphic, that'd be my second with Robin Hood in the lead. Yeah, That's I mean, so what is it about Robin Hood that, that makes that one of your favorite? Uh, I mean, it, it's playing to all the notes that, you know, is the stuff that I'm into. It's it's medieval rangers wandering through the forest trying to yep. do good <laughs> deeds and it's animal characters because humans mess everything up and you know <laughs> plus it's, it's got <laughs> roger miller as a chicken yeah what could sure. be better it's, than that it's got phil harris uh <laughs> that's right I, I i mean i'm i'm of the wrong age but my my dad grew up on uh old time radio like he was alive when there wasn't television and, and radio programs were the thing. And so yep. uh, I got to hear all kinds of tapes of old time radio. So I knew yeah. Phil Harris from the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show and the Jack Benny show. Um, so then to have him as Baloo was just, or, and, and then, you know, little John in, right. uh, in Robin Hood was just like, yeah, this is a familiar, a familiar <laughs> voice. I know this guy. That's fantastic. My, my dad to this day, his, his, uh, his uh, substitute cuss word of choice is oodalolly. Oodalolly, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm so sweaty. I don't think he's using that right, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of our childhoods, if you could regain an object from your childhood, what would it be? It could be a toy. It could be anything, but something lost that you would love to regain. Wow. Wow. Um, there have been a few things that have slipped through that, that, you know, I've had in my hands that now I wish, um, one of them's not really childhood. I, I made the decision to let this thing go in my, in my twenties. That's fine. Uh, it was, it was artwork. It was, um, Ooh. I used to have, uh, there was a, a built in uh, the whole wall was a built in in my childhood bedroom it had four drawers and four closet doors the whole wall was like a uh, storage and i used one of those drawers for just storing drawings and i took my the brown paper sacks that they put all your comics in after you went to the comic yes. shop oh I yeah would, i would save those as my filing system and i'd write on the outside you know this these are the drawings for this project these are the drawings for that project <laughs> and awesome. i just shove drawings in there and i go in that drawer and when uh my dad eventually was going to be moving out and selling the house he said you know you need to come back you need to pick you need to take stuff with you or decide that it, it goes i'm not going to make that decision for you and uh, i was living in a studio apartment so i had to be very picky uh even with that drawer and i I chose certain bags of art to come with me and certain ones I would look at and I'd go, I don't know that there's anything so special here. And I, Oh, that's hard to do. I let it go. I let it go. It was, it was drawings from my teens and, uh, I, yeah, I wish I had those back. Someone out there has a very rare collection, a brown paper sack of David Peterson, Drawings. They, they actually might have gotten burned. <laughs> Ooh, oh, no. no one has them. Well, then. you gave them a good Viking yeah. send off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gave them a good, a yeah. good send off. Uh, Inspiration I, floating uh, in the air. One of the reasons I want them back. It's not even so much that they were good drawings or anything. Um, and I have lots of drawings from that era, so it's not like I'm, I'm, you know, at a loss for nostalgia there. But um, a buddy and I who used to draw together from the like. From 14 till, 
I don't know, we were 18 at least. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were, we were connected at the shoulder and the hip, just sitting next to each other drawing. And we created so many ideas for original IPs. Um, you know, there were a lot of kids at that age who want to like sit down and they want to do their fan art of the Ninja Turtles or the X-Men right. or whatever. We, we did some yeah. of that, but we also were like, we need to make up our own superhero team. Oh, yes. That's, yes. that's as yes. like soap opera <laughs> as the X-Men. We need to come up with a cool space opera <laughs> that has uh, waves of ship le- ships like Robotech. We need to come up with a group of characters <laughs> that would be the magic words. outsiders in the human world like the mutant ninja turtles you know and we came up with our own kind of things not just like oh here are characters that would fit into ninja turtles no if we were doing our own thing this is what it would be and now he and i have decided to do a, a video podcast where we go back and we look at all that old stuff because oh. we have a lot of the oh, that's old amazing old. Um, so we look at those things and then we each do a new drawing. We, we explain what the, you know, who the characters were, what the story was. We talk about what was cool about that idea, what was super lame about that idea. We show the embarrassing artwork and, uh, and then we each do a new drawing That's now because awesome. we both still draw, um, what, what that would look like if we were actually working on it today. It's called the plot masters project. The oh, what a good project. idea. Yeah. Oh, folks, that. check cool. that out. Keep your eyes open. That is such a great idea. That's awesome. Are you yeah. going to have so, like guest artists on with their own embarrassing? Uh... We have a, so we 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 sat down when we came up with this idea. He found a box of artwork um, that was stored at his mom's, and he had texted me to say like, "Hey, I have this stuff," and I was like, "Why?" Immediately, like, "What's in it? What characters? What's the?" <laughs> I, I want to go. And he's like, don't worry, don't worry. We'll, we'll, I'll share it with you. And he was giving it to me like a little bit at a time piecemeal. And I'm like, you're killing me. You got to tell me everything that's in this box. So he came over and brought the box. So this is pre-COVID. Brought the, the box over and we went through it. And, and we joked about like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait until we reveal all to the world about the plot, the history of the secret history of the plot masters or something. And I was like. Actually, I think there's a podcast in that. So um, we sat down and we counted up the number of episodes that we could do. um, And we had like 30 some IPs (laughs) um, that could be individual episodes. And I was like, let's just do let's break this into four seasons of 10 episodes each. And then uh, let's pad it out with doing some double episodes because some of these are too big for one episode and let's yeah. uh, let's have some guests come in so we we've uh we're just about to finish season one in march and then um seasons two through four all have at least one slot already planned out to have a guest come in that's incredible thanks well getting into some more nostalgia or at least bringing us to the first cover yes. the first cover we all saw of the mouse guard um my own story is tied to the pals city of books here in portland we have this giant bookstore giant. that's taking up several blocks Powell's, and you right? could spend what's yeah, that Powell's, yeah pals yeah. Yeah. city of books you could spend a whole day in there and i did and i don't remember what led me to picking the shelf but i do remember the orange leaves and seeing the mice peeking out of the orange leaves and immediately picking it up and saying this has got to go home with me that is the fall um 1152 mouse guard yes and our first cover what we have like i said is orange leaves the front cover is just orange leaves i've got it right here with me it's very well loved. I've lent it out way too much, and the heathens <laughs> have done their number on it. But I wanted people to I wanted people to, to experience it. But yeah, we've got orange leaves, and we've got um, the three main characters peeking out from underneath the leaves. Their personalities are on their little little mousy faces, um, but they're looking they're looking determined and dangerous. And then on the back cover, we have. Uh, what we think is the black axe a mouse holding the black axe up and uh he's framed by the leaves now my book has the description over that image but we have the full image up here and um the continuity is just great and then behind him is the the army that's marching towards a lock haven so yes. get the full the full atmosphere yep. what is the genesis of mouse guard what what led to this world, this story. 
Mouse Guard started, it was back during that high school period where uh, the other guy, his name was Jesse Glenn. Jesse Glenn and I and a couple other friends from high school were all kind of coming up with comics and characters and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> one of them was working, Jesse was working on one, uh, drawing one that was kind of our, our Ninja Turtles that it was set in modern day called Cat's Trio. Uh, Mike was working on kind of like a Star Wars-esque, you know, fantasy or a, a future sci-fi kind of thing. And so I thought, oh, I should, like, if we're going to round this out, I should do something that's set in the past. And I like, you know, kind of medieval D&D, Robin Hood-esque stuff. So um, I came up with something that was very much like Disney's Robin Hood that had uh, a tiger and a ram and a bear and a fox and a possum and a yeah. duck. Um, and, but no mice. Um, and And... I played around with that for a while, uh, and then in college, I, I dusted the idea off again. I was like, "Huh? Well, can I? Could I ever do something with this? Does this thing actually have some life in it?" Um, and I thought I wanted to do something kind of like Tolkien did with races, where they have their own cultures, they have their okay. own languages, they have their own architecture styles, they have their own belief system, everything, right? Except I do that with every animal species. And I set parameters for myself of what would be the biggest animal, what would be the smallest animal. Biggest would be a bear, smallest would be a mouse. And I went, well, wait, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do this and also keep like predator prey relationships active, um, like Aesop's fables, um, yeah, where they're not they're not all buddies. They're you know all the all yeah, the animal instincts are there. Of... Yeah, uh, how am I gonna make that work? How how are these small creatures like especially like mice? How do they stay involved in the story? You know, it's not right. like in it's not right. like in Tolkien where, you know, when the hobbits come out of the Shire into the wider world, that world of elves and men and dwarves just kind of chuckle like, oh, little hobbits, you can't yeah. do you can't change the world. You're too small. But none of them are like, look, hobbits, let's eat hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very right? different so, story. So, like, how do I get mice into the story and have them involved? If I could put up a little bit of, you know. Uh, quid pro quo kind of thing where they have a mutual understanding for a while, but uh, that's that tension can only last for so long. How do you how do you keep these characters alive? So I started working on mouse uh, culture and their civilization and how would this group of mice stay alive? And over time, realized that's the story, that's the compelling part. All the rest of it can just go to the background. They can just become predators. We're all viewing it from the mouse's point of view because everyone knows what it's like to feel very small in a world that's very big, whether that's a professional thing or a relationship thing or a friendship yeah. thing. Um, everyone knows what it's like to feel like whatever's up against them is insurmountable. So that's, that's where it came from. And then I, I still sat on it for a while, uh, partly cause I was, you know, I was in college and yeah, just surviving by, you know, taking odd jobs and stuff. Um, but after, uh, after I was I was married and more settled in a, a full time job, I uh, I started going to a comic convention and people saw my drawings for Mouse Guard, uh, and they were like, "When does this book come out?" Yes. Uh, so the first couple people I answered uh, that I answered, I was like, "There's no book. These are just character designs." Um, and then I uh, I realized I was missing a trick, so I went, "Oh, the book will be out for the next convention," and that convention right. ran. <laughs> Uh, twice a year so it was like I gave myself a six month deadline to write and draw the first issue so they're that's like hey that's too bad man I would have paid good money for that right now you're like hey maybe yeah. we should get started yeah. on that yeah time to get started <laughs> time to do it so I yeah I, I nothing like a deadline yeah I self-published that first issue and uh and it worked pretty well at my local convention I happened to be going to the San Diego convention not to set up just to walk around and see the spectacle that same year, a um, couple months later, and I had some copies with me because this is back in the days of message boards. There were people that I knew from message boards that were going to be doing a meetup, and I thought, oh, they were all, so many of them were so supportive of Mouse Guard. I want to make sure they can get copies yeah, because they were so helpful during the creation of it. And uh, I bumped into somebody else I knew from, from my hometown convention, and he was like, you're shopping Mouse Guard around to take it to a, to a publisher, right? That's what's happening, right? And I was like, no, who wants this weird square book about mice? Like, and I pointed to the banner. It's like, what does Marvel want that? Does, does DC want that? And he's like, well, no, but some of the smaller publishers I think would. In fact, Mark Smiley just started up a company called Archaea 
And so we went over and, um, yeah, I basically got a contract on the spot. It was a, a weird, oh, awesome. a weird yeah. string of luck. Like uh, you can't, Come on. you can't give somebody advice on how to make that happen again. Cause it was so serendipitous. That's an amazing right. story. Yeah. It's one of those situations where it all just comes together. That's very cool. Um, so why animals? What, what, uh, what is it about the animals that made you want to, uh, you know, make your story about uh, about them rather than uh, human characters? Um, I was always better at drawing animals and creatures <laughs> than I am at humans. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think there's some. I mean, I just I like talking animal stories, and I always have. Um, I don't know, like, I don't want to sound like I sat down at the very beginning and thought, hmm, here are all the perfect reasons to do an animal story instead of one with, with humans. But, you know, looking back on it, I realize there's, there's some stuff that, um, you get away from when they're animal characters. Uh, one is you can automatically kind of imbibe those characters with, with personality traits or things that the audience picks up on that have to do with our understanding of animals. Like... The mm-hmm. fact that they're mice means we all know that they're vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Right. If, I, if I did a medieval story with a group of humans going to slay a dragon instead of slaying a snake, the audience, one, knows that dragons aren't real, and two, a human is them. So right. the human isn't weak. It's just smaller than the dragon, which is also right. fictional, so do we really have to worry when it's mice versus a snake, you're like, m- mice versus, yeah, versus a snake. You're like, oh, mice are very small. They're very vulnerable. And I've seen this play out on Animal Planet. I know how this fight ends. <laughs> Snakes are real. Prove mice, me wrong. Yeah, mice are real. <laughs> this is bad. This is really bad. So I can infuse all of this, like, you know, if I did an owl character. You know, uh, I mean, I did have an owl in, in Mouse yeah. I didn't even play up so much on this trope, but the idea of like, you know, if, if it was a little bit more anthropomorphized, if you had an owl character, everyone assumes that it's wise. Right. If you put a fox right. or maybe a crow character in, oh, maybe it's a little tricksy. It's a little, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's more of a D&D rogue or, or a ranger. <laughs> you know, it's a, li- it's a little yeah. more sly than, you know, if you put a lion in, it's noble, it's a king, it's a... You know, there are these these tropes that we already all understand in kind of a collective subconscious and everything that we've been trained to do. So th- there's that with animals that you can you can lean on that stuff. Um, and then you actually you get away from some, um, some just some negative stuff, some negative stereotype stuff. You know, if you yeah. choose to yeah. make a character uh, have a certain race or a certain look or a certain hairstyle or whatever. <clears throat> Um, whether it's a, a general stereotype that maybe a lot of people hold, or maybe just certain readers are going to automatically infuse something positive or negative about a certain uh, gender or skin color or religion or whatever. But when I'm drawing mice and cloaks, all of that goes away. There's no... Right. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The other thing I think is really cool, which I actually didn't, I didn't really think of until... Uh, recently when I was reading through the books again was because you don't have humans in the books, it leaves me, it adds this whole new uh, like level unspoken level to the story where I'm kind of like, is this after humans have been wiped out? Do humans (laughs) exist during like during this? Did they find human stuff and like not know what it is, but try to copy it? Like, is this in the yeah. past before humans exist? Like, do they find a boot? Is there a boot somewhere that a bunch yeah. of mice live in? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So it's uh, this cool yeah. unspoken thing of Did like, a wizard are turn there all even the humans people? into mice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you guys find that fun. I've, I've answered that uh, just to my own fans, never in the books. But yeah, it's uh, this is a world just where humans never existed. If, if you okay. think about a role playing game where, you know, you get a certain number of points to allocate into your character and. There are only so many to go around. It's like if you were, if you had so many points to create a world and you didn't have humans, you can allocate those points to everything else. And so right. they get the ability to speak and think and maybe walk on their hind legs and maybe have some thumbs yeah. um, and things like that and, and be able to develop metallurgy and stonemasonry and stuff like that. <laughs> but they're not, uh, yeah. 
yeah, they're not mutated. It's not, uh, yeah, yeah. it's just, uh, and I wanted to keep the humans out of it because I don't, two things, one, humans ruin everything. And, uh, <laughs> and two, um, I never want there to be the deus ex machina kind of thing where, where the it's like, shows up, yeah. right. Where there's always the like, I'll save you. Know, you. Yeah, Han Solo blazing in to just yeah. shoot out yeah. Vader's, Vader's Tie Fighter of like, you know, great yeah. job, kid. Now let's blow this thing. Go home. Like, I don't want the human. <laughs> I don't want a human to come in, a human foot to come in and step on yeah. the crab. <laughs> yeah. Or the audience right. to even be thinking that that's yeah, that that could be a, a possibility. possibility. A possibility. And I've had right. a few things that I've put in that people think are nods to humans. And unfortunately, I'm like, oh, no, I see where you see that. That's not what it's supposed to be. Shoot, I screwed up. <laughs> Well, um, like one of the things, uh, again, when rereading it, that is very unhuman like is that the world is so perilous and so full of giant monsters. I mean, you get that like shadow of the Colossus feel that like these there's giant monsters everywhere that it's just so unbelievable and heinous that the mice would fight each other. Like when in in the storyline, like the right. mice are attacking each other or fighting within themselves it's just so like what are you doing it just isn't done because there are wolves out there there's right. a there's bears and 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 you're gonna you're gonna fight like that that was one of those things that's like gosh that is such a good message that we should be thinking even though we don't see giant wolves and giant bears and owls and stuff there are like bigger things that we should be worried but, about as a species it's, it's a staple of every kind of fiction that has um, I mean, there, there's, of course, the classic kind of Watchmen thing of, the, you know, there, there is a becomes a third party, an alien species that then unifies yeah. humanity to go, oh, we have bigger problems. But for the most part, when we tell these stories, like any zombie story, any kind of a plague, any kind of a virus, any kind of thing that's bigger than us, the story ends up being about how these factions of humans sabotage each other. Because right. no one can trust yeah. each other. You know, there's it. zombies at the door, but I'm, <laughs> I don't know that we can trust this guy. I'm the king of this town. Let's take all their food. Let's who ate yeah. all the jerky. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like it's it's innate. So switching gears a little bit to the actual some of the actual technical stuff we here yeah. at Cover Decoder. Mm. We love covers. David. We, love them. we we love covers. They. They are the portal to the material inside this beautiful, luscious material. So I'm curious. We've we've talked to some. We've interviewed some other musicians uh, about what comes first, the cover or the content, and it's always sort of a mixed bag. So I'm curious. Uh, where do the covers arrive in your conception of these? Uh, I guess maybe of, of all your projects. Is it the last thing you do? Do you start with a cover to kind of get you going? Do you have like maybe a preliminary sketch that you go, Oh, that would be, that would be a great cover. Or do you just kind of just start throwing sketches out there? Um, and that comes later. So the, the cover that you guys have been referencing, which is the, the cover to the, the first collection, the first collected edition. Yes. Um, uh, the content had all come out before then. Right. No, I, I had to have the last issue done, I think, before I started on the cover, I think. If not, I was very close to finishing the last issue before I started on the cover. So the content of the book was, was for the most part, done. With the first issue of Mouse Guard ever, um, I think the cover did come first because... Uh, and it was just a general, like, I'm just going to draw a mouse with a snake and it's going to be evocative oh, yes. of... Of kind of what I'm going to end up doing, but I don't know that yeah, I had. Is. I don't know that I had drawn anything in the issue. For, I actually don't know which came first. There, I, I kind of remember the cover came first, but yeah, for the most part, at least the concept for the content has to come first because the cover has to represent it. Right. You know, right. The cover has to represent what the story moment is, and with the way comics are done, is uh, they get solicited through through Diamond. And the covers have to be in so far in advance ah. that I am always having to do the cover before I draw the issue. But I okay. definitely have to know what's in that issue. I, I have an outline done before okay. I've, I've drawn a cover um, for an issue. Um, and then we did a we did a spinoff anthology called Legends of the Guard. Oh, where guest, guest artists told tall tales and legends that are set in the Mouse Guard world. 
And for that, it's like it's it's my sitting in a tavern uh, trying to win a storytelling competition to clear their bar tab. I draw all the tavern scenes. And as soon as a mouse starts their story, that's where it's the guest artist. So then what do you do for covers for those? Do I do I draw mice sitting in a tavern for every issue? Do I draw one of the stories and that's almost like picking a favorite. Right. And so I just kind of went like, and plus we had to have the covers in so far in advance. I probably won't see finished art from the guests before I have to turn in a cover. So I just went like, whatever, I'm just going to do cool stuff. It's just going to be cool. <laughs> yeah. Like they're getting to make up fairy tale stories and fantasy stories and kind of Paul Bunyan esque stories about the mice. I'm going to do something like that. that can all be summarized on one cover. I'm going to show a mouse that is the king uh, under the sea, the undersea king mouse. I'm going to show uh, the story of the, the the mouse band that played so well, that could play their instruments so well. It rose the dead uh, from their graves and all, oh. the, all the ghost mice danced to the music. Like, I just, just whatever it is, I just want to do something cool. So those definitely come first and are just all about doing something fun and cool and different and thinking outside of the box. But for the most part, I have to know what's in the issue before I draw the cover. That's awesome. Is that, would you, is that kind of a freeing experience being able to just like, you know, tight, tighten up, you know, finish, finish off the, whatever you're working on with that front page and be like, there it is. It's done. I can send it. Um, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> it's, it's you also have to make sure that you um it covers are weird because you're trying to summarize yeah. uh what's in the book yeah but you also don't want to steal a panel from yourself yes right like that's you don't, the kind of covers we believe in I, you I, don't <laughs> You know, it's if it's if it's you know, let's say you're doing an X Men comic, right? And you've got this moment where like Magneto is is holding Colossus up off the ground by his neck because you know he's got the power of magnetism, and all the other X Men are laying unconscious in a pile around Magneto's feet, and that's like that's the pinnacle moment of the issue, right? Yep. <laughs> that also would make a killer cover. But now you've robbed a panel from yourself. Yeah. Right. You can't spoil that. Right. Or if you do, you need to make the progression like if it was a if it was a film, you know, that would be that would be a, a long hold of that moment and the music would boom boom. Boom boom. Right, Hans you know, Zimmer. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Han. <laughs> and in that way, you need that moment to be the splash page in the comic. If you want to use it for the cover, it means you have to cut the editing and the film movement yeah. of the panels totally different. You have to make these fast moments. It's it's not this this horrific, oh no, what's going to happen? It's you need to have Jubilee was actually faking it. She wasn't unconscious. Fireworks, Magneto's hair catches on fire, <laughs> whatever. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not I'm not an X-Men writer obviously. But uh, you know, you do the thing that that gets that out of it quicker. And then you have Jubilee fall into peril and et cetera. And it's just a whole bunch of fast moments. It's a big action scene instead of a showstopper. And then you can use that showstopper for the cover. Or you have to come up with something different for the cover if you want it to be a showstopper in, in the book. And there have been times where I've gone, crap, I don't really have a good way of working around this. I have to essentially redraw the cover as a panel. But I'm going to have to maybe mm. show it from a slightly different angle. I'm going to have to show it maybe mm, gotcha. a second before that action happens or a second after that action happens. Or just frame it in some way where it's not the exact same thing. But sometimes it's unavoidable. Yep. So when when you see a cover that really like blows you away, uh, what are you looking for? And how does that like kind of affect your own uh, covers? Uh, I feel like I need a character to connect with. Okay. Um, sometimes you get cool. I, I think it's more like book, uh, you know, prose book covers where you can be more evocative and 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 mood thematic. Um, but I think with comic covers, I want a character I, I I recognize, I collect, or I mean, I I connect with, even if it's a new character I've never met them before. There's something about the, the either the peril they're in or or something that I. I get. I'm like I know exactly who that is and why their, yeah, why their face is in that expression or why their body language is there. 
Um, and I just want it to be well drawn. I don't want it to be muddy. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I also don't want it to just be a, a bad poster. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't want it to just be like, yeah. just check it out. I posed the character. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I phoned everything in. No, it needs to be a moment. It needs to be a full. Like, you need to go to the golden age of illustration and look at, uh, yeah. you know, look at Lendecker and 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 uh, Rackham and Duloc and yes. Norman Rockwell and think about how a whole story can be told in a single image. Yeah. And that's the kind of idea that you need to be bringing to comics. You don't have to draw it in that style or anything, but there need to be cues and nods around in the background or the or the, you know, the costuming or something that tells me. There are moments before this, and there are moments after this. This is not a photo shoot with main character going, ha ha! And, right. you know, there's a backdrop behind them. It's not that. That's not a good cover. Yeah, I think you capture that in, in your fall uh, yeah. omnibus uh, one. I mean, if I had never read it before, you know, holding it for the first time, it's like, okay, so you got mice, and they got these weapons, and who's this looming guy with the axe? Like, it tells the story and it, it brings you in and wants you, it, it invites you in to open the pages and, and see what's going right. on inside. So thank you. It's, it's, it can be a real trick. Um, that, that fall book, you know, uh, it's a front cut. It's a full wraparound, but the front cover is basically summarizing moments that happen in the first issue. Yeah. Um, which is kind of a weird thing when you're thinking about trying to summarize a whole, you know, a whole six yeah. issue arc. Like I, right. the front cover, I basically pick something from issue one and then the back cover is more like issue five. And I kind of like yeah. just made them one scene like, you, you know, you don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that can be hard picking where it is because you don't want to spoil something. I'm, I'm actually I just got hired to do some covers um, for something right now. And uh, it's a six issue arc. I'm doing the, the guest covers. And uh, the the main oh. character almost doesn't appear in the first issue. Like they show up in the last three pages. Yeah. Oh. And so I talked to the editor. And I was like, so I can I can focus the main cover on this other character who definitely has more more to do. I can do that kind of cover. But I I do worry that you're not going to be happy if I do that because it's about it's, the other it's, character. It's well, and it's like if this was issue two. Having a secondary character as the main thing on the cover, totally cool. Right. Issue one of a new arc, yeah. having not the main character on the cover, like, do, can we can we do that? Do you want? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yes, please read the other issues. <laughs> yeah. And even though this isn't a trade, this is the first issue cover. He's kind of like almost like do a trade cover. You know, summarize themes of the story. And make that the number one cover rather than what actually okay. happens in issue one. It's so and, like, and I'm struggling with it because like I don't because yeah. I don't want to spoil it. I don't want right. to spoil things, and especially spoil things that don't even happen in that right. issue. Like <laughs> I don't want to spoil something that's going to actually come two issues later. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Do you find it easier to work on your own material or um, mm -hmm. someone else's material or or vice versa? I mean. Like from my own experience, sometimes something that I created, I have a harder time feeling like I got it right rather than something else that someone else has created. I mean, sometimes it's easy just to just to do the like work for hire style thing. Like I'm not as emotionally invested in this. Right. Not that I'm not emotionally invested, but I, I, I you know, I'm not going to spin out on it. I'm going to go. This is the job. These are the characters. I need to draw them well. I like this guy. I'm and focus uh, on them. yeah, and I, I I've done my share of those, and and sometimes those are nice. Um, and I've been pretty lucky recently in that I haven't had a lot of um, editorial rework because uh, a lot of times now with with so many properties being corporately owned, and then those rights being licensed out to comic book companies, there there's a chance that in a in addition to uh, pleasing the editor. Ooh. You also have to please whoever corporately has licensed it out. So, like, I've done my share of Ninja Turtle covers. Yes. Nick Nickelodeon owns the Ninja Turtles. So not only do I have to make my IDW hap 
editor happy, I also have to make Nickelodeon happy. And I've been pretty lucky in that they don't generally come back with edits or reworks or anything like that. But occasionally, I've had that. I've had a couple horror stories. Not on Ninja Turtles, but on some other stuff. I've had some horror stories where, you know, they go fix this this way. And I go, that I guarantee you that's going to make the cover worse. Yep. And they go, well, the corporate, you know, it's a comic editor going, the corporate the corporate people want you to do that, so please do that. And I go, okay, you're going to be asking me for the other file back in 10 minutes, I guarantee you. <laughs> and I do it, and they go, okay, yeah, you were right. But uh, <laughs> they also don't want to show that you were right, so can you do it, like, to, you know, to a half degree so that they still got their way? I'm like, uh, okay, you know. And so I've had some of those. And so when it's my own stuff, and, and there's also the delay, like, when you... When you pencil a cover um, that's for someone else, you then have to send it off and you have to wait right. for that that approval, that that chain of approval. Sometimes it's it's more complicated. Um, and then same thing for the inks and then same thing for the colors. And at any point they could come back and go, oh, we don't like this part. Change it. Um, I mean, generally, by the time you get to the inks, they go, eh, this was better in the pencils. They can't go, change the whole cover. Or they can't, at the color stage, go, mm, what if this other character was there instead? Oh, Although, yeah. I've ha- I have I have oh. had that happen. Oh. Um, but in general, it's they're commenting on the colors when you submit the colors. They're commenting on the inks when they send the inks. But it, it, it breaks up the rhythm. And when I'm working on my own stuff, if I finish the pencils and I'm like, I'm... I'm digging this i'm in a groove and i want to go i just go i can just go i can go and stop based on my own rhythm my own interest my own uh, energy levels and i don't have to wait um so working on my own stuff that's nicer Mm -hmm. being able to get into that flow um i also will have lots of conversations with myself about a cover as i'm making it about like do i do this do i do that and yes and when there's uh another party involved a lot of times they want to be a part of that conversation right. or they don't even realize they do they ask later like well uh that's an interesting design but what if you had included this and you think like what I, if we had I, a hat i, I had eliminated yeah. <laughs> you know like i had eliminated that character from the cover three decisions ago you hadn't even seen it like i i considered that but ruled it out for yeah. all of these reasons and now i have to explain all those reasons to somebody else and it's and it's not like it's ever horrible. It's just so much yeah. easier to just go. I'm going to draw the thing that I want. I get to have the conversations with myself. Does this look better? Does that mm-hmm. look better? If I make the decision, it looks better without that character. Right. Erased or what? out goes that layer or whatever, and I can just do my thing. With with Mouse Guard, did you ever have publisher saying? Uh, Hey David, I, I don't know about this page here or, or this thing, or do you just turn long. it in? You, you're happy yeah, with it. Can you it? make his cape yellow? <laughs> like, no. I uh, so Archaea That's was founded. Awesome. Archaea was founded by Mark Smiley, who had his own book called Artesia for a long time, um, and Artesia had been published by another publisher, and he had had problems with that publisher. Okay. I don't know all, to the extent of what what all the dispute was over but he had to uh wait to get his rights back it, there was some kind of thing where if they hadn't published anything new in a certain amount of time he got his rights back so he purposely didn't create anything new so they couldn't publish anything new but when he got his rights back he wanted to self-publish and he had to to get into diamond to create his own publishing company like it had to go under a no. under a publisher name so he created Archaea. And then eventually he opened the doors to other people. So when he opened oh. the other doors to other people, like myself and um, Dave Lewis and Marv Mann and Alex Shakeman and a couple other folks, um, he made the creator contract very friendly. Um, and then I think there was also a little bit of like, as a creator, he went, I don't want to be telling people what to do. I wouldn't <laughs> want people telling me what to do. But also, truth be told, when Archaef was founded, there were three people who worked there. I mean, there there wouldn't have been anyone. Oh man, to go like to look through the issue. I mean, we they were needed bare, content. Yeah, we were barely getting it. Well, not just not. I don't just mean in terms of content. I mean in terms of like man hours, someone to sit through and edit the book. Oh, you know, like, gotcha. There just wasn't any. But there was the guy who was doing all the bookkeeping. There was Mark who was you know doing all the contract work. He was also making his own book at the time. He was the one dealing with Diamond. 
Um, they had someone who was doing tr- uh, part time who was doing translations because they also got the rights to some French books, and they had that okay. person doing some of the spell checking. But oh. early issues of Mouse Guard <laughs> still went out with um, with spelling errors and punctuation errors because there was just there was nobody checking it. And by the time Archaea gets bigger, or then Archaea gets purchased a couple different times by different folks, um, Mouse Guard is successful enough. Every one of them was yeah. smart enough to go. If it ain't broke, we're not fixing it. Like yeah, right. I have editors now who are just supportive and go, "Hey, if you want to talk about story stuff, if you're if you're lost or whatever, you know, uh, I can I can I can weigh in if you want." But none of them are going. Yeah, if his cloak could be yellower, or could you make? What about, <laughs> what about hedgehogs? I think we don't have enough hedgehog yeah, representation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, <laughs> Yeah, with the punctuation, you can just say at that point, you can say, "Oh, it's it's a mouse." They're dialect. mice, it's, man. It's Come a, on, it's a mouse thing. You you we uh, won't understand it. I you just don't understand. I do some of that with the drawings where I'm like, "Oh, I didn't draw that very well. That looks like it would break, or that looks like it would." Ah, eh, that's how mice do it. It was mice. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, it was built by mice. What do you expect? Well, yeah. So well, the geom- like is and it's usually like I draw bad geometry like ooh that perspective isn't right well of course it's not right because it was built by mice yeah. they, they use mouse meters <laughs> to measure things yeah. Yeah. Um, well before we leave this cover just real quick you had mentioned um, you and and your your two friends originally are are the three main characters represented um, by aspects of your personality or your friends or are they just um, characters that you you made out of a uh, whole cloth that you felt would be interesting it was to the story. A- actually, those three that I mentioned that uh, you know one was working on something current day, one was working on something future, and one was uh, and then I was going to do something in the past. Those were the three first mouse characters that I came up with. Oh, okay, and it was cool. Sax- Saxon, Kenzie, and Rand. Now in the in the book, and the the third member who's on the cover isn't Rand; it's Liam. Right. Um, right, And Liam is actually based on another friend of mine, a different friend of mine. That's awesome. Um, and the yeah. reason that I ended up doing the swap was that Liam as a character was supposed to be young. He was new. Mm-hmm. He didn't know all the ropes yet. And it's a storytelling trick because if you have three characters who all have been working together for years, they know each other, they know what their job is. How do I explain things to the audience? Yeah. But right. if Liam is new and he's like, what are we doing? <laughs> Why does this matter? Yeah. The other two characters can kind of explain things to him in a way that they're really explaining it to the audience. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I swapped out Rand just to have a less experienced character in there. But he's also, like I said, based on a friend. Yeah, that's incredible. That's so cool. Yeah, and I feel like, too, Liam is kind of the audience as well or the the, the reader. I mean, mm-hmm. how can you not, like, you know, identify with this, you know, this young mouse who's trying to prove his mettle? You just want to you just want to take up that that little sword of his. So f- for the next slide, I've just got uh, one of the, the covers from the comics. And um, I have it up here just because I know you use digital, uh, you color digitally, but this almost looks like real watercolor. Or, or <laughs> pen, you. and I was wondering is the is the is the brushes that good? It's 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 the one it's it's my one of my favorite uh, mouse guards, uh, Conrad. It's Conrad uh, puncturing ah, a yes. uh, crab, impaling this crab. But and I also him I also up. came across the same thing with the the very first cover with uh, Liam and the snake uh, coiling so, around him. Um, so those uh, two, Li- Liam, the very first one with Liam. Has kind of a white background other than the mm-hmm. snake. Um, that one and Conrad with the crab. Those two are traditional watercolors. They're yeah. Really yeah. Are. Those are the only two that are. Although the, the Conrad one has some digital trickery. Um, crabs aren't orange uh, <laughs> no. until you cook them. So the oh. look of every, what everyone thinks of is what a crab should right. look like. It's orange. Um, they're actually kind of this like purpley brown yeah. um, when they're just still living. Um, so I painted that one more neutral colored. And then after I saw it, just went, it's just not reading as a crab. I know yeah. it's not real that it should be orange, but people will understand if it's orange. So I, in Photoshop, tinted yeah. All the paint there, so it was it was more red in color. But those are the only two that are that are watercolor. Um, when I self published the first issue of Mouse Guard, uh, I was using a print on demand company, and the the deal, like their standard deal, was color cover, black and white interiors. 
Um, and since I was only going to have to color the cover, okay. and I was most experienced at that time with watercolors, uh, I, I painted the cover. By the time Archaea gets involved, they want to publish it in color. We talked about hiring a colorist, um, and I said, can I do some samples just to show a colorist what it would look, what I, what I want the look to be. Right. Um, and by that time I had also, cause there was a gap between the first issue coming out self published and then meeting up with Archaea. I had sold most of the originals, um, to help seed money for self publishing an issue two, which I never ah. needed to do. Cause then I ended up meeting up with Archaea. Um, so I, there was no way to watercolor the originals anymore. That option was gone. So I had to do digital color. Um, I did my digital samples and then Mark Smiley, head of the company, who also painted his own comic. He watercolored the pages of his own comic. He was like, you know, I kind of like the idea that you're going to, that you would color your own comic. I think if we handy the samples off to anybody, we're, what we get back is going to be something less than what you're doing. So let's just go, let's just go with you doing it. Uh, so just add, add it onto the wagon, man. Yeah. Give me another task. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I had to very quickly teach myself yeah. kind of how to digitally color, um, wow. effectively. Uh, and then I, because I had watercolored the first cover, I decided I was going to still watercolor the second one, even though I didn't need to. Right. Um, and I almost watercolored the third, uh, but the third had enough going on that I scanned the inks and started digitally coloring it just as a map, like just a just a quick like blocking out the color. So this would be red, this would be purple, this would be whatever. Right. Um, and then as I'm like almost done with the what would be the color flats of this thing, I went, why am I going to stop now and then paint it? If I just finish coloring this, I'm done. And everyone likes the colors that I'm doing for the yeah. interiors. Why am I yeah. making the covers different? So from that point on, everything was just digital color. Well, they look Makes great. Makes a lot of I, sense. Yeah, I mean, we're going to get into your process more, but yeah, I've, okay. you, you're very gen generous with showing your process. It's just these two covers, when I, again, rereading it, um, getting ready for the interview, I was like, whoa, that's some, those are some serious brushes. I don't know where he got those. Um, but it makes sense that it's the, uh, the original watercolor. And you know what? You can just call those crabs, the North, North coast fire crabs. They're, in, they're not <laughs> That's in right. our world. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. They're getting boiled by that hook being shoved through their stomach. Oh man. Yeah. I yeah. love that scene where he like grabs the one, goes over the top, flips it over and connects it to the other crab. Oh, that's, and then that scene, I was like, Conrad, oh my God. I was so, I barely did any writing on on a lot of fall i i really yeah. left it almost like a i was i was game mastering my own role-playing session within this comic and i didn't know what was coming until i told myself um i was i was dealing with very loose outlines and for that issue it was like you know this happens that should take two pages this happens that should take three pages when it got to the crab battle it was like crab battle six pages <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's all it said and uh, I had started trying to work some stuff out one night, and it just wasn't going well. And I was like, well, I guess tomorrow's another day. I went to bed, and then that morning as I was waking up, like, all the choreography just kind of came, just came to me. <laughs> yeah. And part of it was, oh, I can, I can like, uh, like taking down an ad at, hey, remember that really old movie, Empire Strikes Back? <laughs> um, I can I've heard uh, of it. I can, take down, uh, I can take down a crab like an ad at. That's um, amazing. Have, yeah, have Conrad use the towing power of another one to flip the one. So. Yeah, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was great. It's a it's a gut wrenching scene too because all you see is this little the crabs go around the little they just bubble. Go around. Just around. <laughs> like, the little no, like, oh. we just <laughs> met you. And then later, you get you... <laughs> the crab legs stabbing through Con. Oh, that uh, yeah. that uh, epilogue scene where uh, the one you just mentioned, where the crab leg is kind of going through, um, is because I had so many fans. Uh, I oh. saw on mess this is again back in the days of message boards, but I had and, and even at conventions people would come up and ask me and they'd go, but we didn't see Conrad die. So he that we burrowed don't, out. We, we don't know that he died, right? He might have fought his way out or he could have <laughs> burrowed or he could have, you know, who knows? Um, you know, Sadie leaves, so we don't know what happens after that. Maybe 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 a human foot comes in. <laughs> uh, you know and i was like oh no i thought i made it pretty clear that he died okay so in the epilogue i was like yeah let's have sadie dealing with the grief of his death and show a quick 
little flash panel of him definitely dead. Yep. Well, no. that's a perfect segue. So I, I'm holding in my hands my Ooh, personal favorite um, of so the collection. Yeah, mine too. Uh, yeah. I love this front and back panel. So for our listeners, uh, this is Mouse Guard Winter 1152. And the front, you have um, our two leads. Now, remind me of the name. We were just talking about this. Is it is it Selena? Kalina. 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 Yeah. Hard C like Celtic. I, I always screw it up. Kalina. We have Kalina, uh, the current Black Axe uh, in this, and Liam uh, trudging through the snow. Uh, and behind, on the back panel, you have... Just this yes. amazing oh, image the evil yes. owl. of this owl with this blaring red eye that uh, was slashed earlier on. And it is just the perfect illustration of this mystery and danger and uh, this ominous tone. And that's what I'm curious about. So the tone of Mouse Guard, it's not graphically violent. Uh, it's not innocent, um, it doesn't feel like it was catered to a specific audience. Uh, yeah. And it, it really feels like, you know, aside from the fact that they do have these anthropomorphic qualities, it feels like you're watching the nature channel in, in some ways. Uh, you know, it's these mice surviving in the real world in regards to their size. Um, and this, you know, this winter front and back panel really convey that. And I'm just kind of curious, how did you arrive at this tone? Um, was that something you you were thinking like, you know, oh, th this is, you know, this is, I'm going to try and, you know, uh, attack it at a more natural angle, or is it, did it just kind of come naturally as you were writing it? I, I think it's just who I am as a storyteller. Yeah. Um, I mean, lo looking back, I can think of, you know, things that I knew I wanted it to be similar to, like I wanted something that felt like The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings or um, the original Star Wars trilogy that... Mm -hmm. You know, if if you want, there's a lot more there that you can read between the lines and, and get some, you know, some pretty big stuff out of. But you can also just on the surface go, woohoo, it's a fun adventure. Right. <laughs> Bees, rafts. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's all fun. Um, the first time that that all of a sudden became I, I, I had to become aware of it where I had to consciously think like, oh, how do I handle this scene? Um, was pretty early on. It was issue two. It was that Conrad issue from fall. Yes. Um, and it was that the first issue of Mouse Guard had, you know, it w Archaea was a tiny little scrappy publisher coming up out of nothing. And Mouse Guard got some, some real interest and real heat in the collecting community. Yeah. And Archaea was like, oh, crap, we don't know exactly how we did this, but we don't want to lose this. <laughs> we don't want to lose the fire. We don't want to lose the interest. So... Anytime we got a cool quote or an endorsement or a whatever, we 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 embraced it. Now I always thought of of Mouse Guard as like for people like me, like at least eighteen, uh, or like when I was collecting comics, like sixteen to eighteen, right. or all right. the way up to I was in my thirties when it started, or late twenties, early thirties when it started. Um, like yeah, some somewhere in there is kind of my audience, and then I found out. So many people were using it with their kids, and then yes. we got we got an endorsement uh, from Comics in the Classroom. I don't know, dot, oh, dot, uh, dot, yeah. dot org or something like that. And they had they had uh, you know done a, a write up about it. They had also put some other material about it out. It was you know here's how we're using it in the classroom. Blah blah blah. Um, but we had taken an excerpt from from their their promotion of it and we had used it to solicit we had used it as a pull quote to solicit issue two now in issue two there's a point where conrad who is supposed to be a very flawed character he's he's not just right you know a, a good you know hero he's flawed yeah and there comes a point where he is lashed himself to the rafters of his hut and is drinking his... rum and it is yeah. implied that he is tanked <laughs> and i was in the middle of drawing that issue when you know the solicitation came out where we used that blurb and i went crap i gotta get rid of this vomit how really fast do, well <laughs> even just how do i have him just tied to the rafters and i was gonna write rum on the on the bottom yeah. right. of the jug i'm like do i 
can I do that now? Can I? And I, I worried about it for a little while. I ended up the, the only real compromise that I made there was I changed rum to XXX, I think. Yeah. Maybe did I do rum? I, you know what? I can quickly, well, quickly look. It, it, um, it reminds me of like uh, the rescuers when they to, to start that uh, <laughs> that dragonfly up, they have to give him the hooch. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like I, yes. we grew up with that. We grew up with yeah. rats of Nim and and Dark Crystal. I mean, there was some dark animation, and yeah. um, you know, I I, th- I think well, when in it's a lot used of ways, for the bad guys, that's one thing. But right. Here yeah. we've got you know we've got a character who's a little complicated here. He's good, but he's flawed. And I, I worried about that. I just looked it up. I, I did both actually. I put rum and XXX on the bottle. <laughs> Cover all your bases. But rum I ended up bad. deciding like I I really shouldn't be using. If they want to get mad about it, they can get mad. Yeah. Uh, I, I I really don't want to use somebody else's measuring stick or metric for what I'm comfortable with doing. And That's if great. I'm okay with it. Because, uh, like I said, I, my, my storytelling isn't to go too gory, too graphic, too violent, right, too yeah. um, too polarizing in any real way. So it's like if if I start using somebody else's measuring stick, that's not that's not good because right. I'm already in a pretty good space. And then also as a creator, you know, what does that do? Uh, how how many masters will I end up having to serve at that point? So um, I became very aware of it there. And every now and then I have a violent scene. Um, where it's not even about catering it to everyone else. It's me going, how do I do this where I feel comfortable? Right. Um, like having having characters use the black axe is actually a, a big problem because it's hard to show anybody using the axe. Right. Without then showing, like, showing... A head in, just right yeah, in half. Yeah, a, ha- mm-hmm. a head flying away or the axe <laughs> embedded in somebody's guts with their innards yeah. spilling out. And it's like, well... Sorry, that's, kids! That's not really Mouse Guard. I don't know that... I want to draw that. Uh, so it's hard then. How do I show that axe right. being used but not go the full graphic? And yeah. So I just I use my own metric. I think it's it's a perfect balance. Yeah, I, I, I've definitely read this to my uh, to my nil bogs, my same. children, and um, they get they get that natural sense of danger. Like it was so cool reading these because you get to those points, um, uh, especially when you know the black axe is about to die. I just remember uh, my daughter was sitting next to me and she just looks at me. She's like, is he, is he going to die? And I'm like, I don't know. We're going to have to find out. Yeah. And it was just this amazing sense where, you know, it, it wasn't over the top. It was a very natural way to lead into these conversations and to show these things right. um, in this awesome environment where they can be comfortable because, you know, it's not the real world. So I, I I really respect um, kind of that tone, that approach that you took. That just that just yeah. seems to have come really naturally and, and they, tastefully yeah. done. I, I know yeah. there's a there's a, a children's author who's done some talked about some of that stuff um, where you know if, as a children's author sometimes you can write stuff that you know some some parents will think is too dark or whatever. Um, this author had a lot of death in their books. Um, Hansel and Gretel. Kirk, characters that that passed away well yeah that's a that's a shorter fairy tale this is this is a longer like you know huge cast of characters where characters are getting picked off and dying right and the author talked about um she was like look what are you really sheltering your kids from like right death exists Mm -hmm. um and i i never glorify it i never make it a, a big deal of like yay hoorah or or gratuitous where it's just one after the other or somebody's used as cannon fodder or a human shield or anything like that right. every every death is mourned and your kids are going to need chances to experience those emotions to practice yeah. them and fiction is the perfect place for everyone to practice their emotions so that god forbid when grandma or grandpa or even mom or dad or brother or sister die unexpectedly because life happens they at least understand the emotions it's still horrible overwhelming grief but it doesn't completely blindside them right yes can take some comfort knowing they've experienced um, those feelings before yeah, we discussed this in our. We did an episode about uh, the scary stories to tell in the dark. I don't know if you remember those. Oh, yeah. Um, that have just the <laughs> over the top graphic, uh, graphic kind of images 
that uh, really had parents in an uproar. Um, and yeah, we came to that same conclusion. I mean, having a safe place to experience death, you know, um, and be able to talk about someone is, is extremely important in fiction, I feel. Yeah, I think role-playing games do a lot of that too because it's not just yeah. about the death thing there. It's also about all kinds of decision-making and compromise and, um, you know, it, I mean, in some ways it's the same stuff that, uh, like the bigger questions that the, the HBO Westworld series brings up of like, mm. you know, like when that, that series started, I know a lot of people who were gamers who were like, yeah, I feel really crappy about things that I do in games now. Like, <laughs> why, is, yeah. why is it okay for me to behave that way in a video game like what if even this was a real robot like that's not cool also right and uh when you're when you're doing that kind of stuff in games and making decisions whether it's about uh uh, you know screwing your friends over or uh because they don't want to do what you want to do or or they want to divide up the gold differently or they want to you know they want to go up to the castle and you want to explore the haunted woods yeah by not going with them they're going to die at the haunted castle (laughs) <laughs> uh, or, or whatever, you know, whatever Personal the stories. Is. Yeah. Or, or stuff like, you know, Hey, we've, we've, uh, all, we got rid of all the orcs, but there's this one that's wounded. What's your party going to do with it? Like, yeah, these, Ooh. these are, these are moral choices that even though in the game, it's probably okay. If you still kill the wounded orc, um, tumble off. you're going to have discussions about it though. Like, and these right. discussions are going to have to do with how you as a human being in the real world understand morality yeah and as the dm you're gonna be like come on guys just kill the orc already come on we gotta <laughs> move on it's been oh, I I, oh I, I'd, <laughs> I'd see whichever way they're leaning and then i'd, and then I'd throw something in to, to push them the other way if they're thinking about saving this thing with its dying breath it's going to be calling them all kinds of offensive terms and talking you know just saying the worst stuff like egging them on to kill it if they're like <laughs> if they're like maybe we can maybe we can get information out of him maybe we could save him maybe it's the right <laughs> thing he's going to push him to, to turn to the dark side and if it's the other way where they're like kill him he'll be please like, sir please uh, he'll be like i know where the magic is hidden. oh yeah <laughs> i always oh, wanted yeah. to come visit you my brother yeah, yeah. I have orklings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, my children. Orklings. My now, children. now that that's going to be a great uh, children's book. The orklings. <laughs> well, um, one of the like when I the the tone and the environments that you create are so rich. I, I've got to ask the question of: Is your real world environments influencing the environments in the comic books? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in Flint, Michigan, which most people don't think of um, looking like anything like Mouse Guard. Oh, but um, yeah. Flint, Flint is an interesting place in that it's um, it's not too far for, from some rural areas. Um, and then even within my own neighborhood, my my area had uh, it was up against a golf course area and a wooded area called the Nature Trails. Um, I could I could walk five minutes and be in trees where no one could see me and know where I was. Yeah. Um, I, if I turned the other direction, I could be headed to a very urban, you know, Seven Eleven, you know, stores and fast cars kind of direction. Um, so I I had both of those. That's um, great. But I did I did a lot <laughs> of exploring in the woods and through the snow and climbing trees and you know kicking fall leaves around and you know getting my boots stuck in mud that just sucked my boots off where I was far enough away from anyone if I had needed help I probably couldn't have gotten it um so yeah that that kind of environment in Michigan totally I'm still in Michigan I'm in Ferndale now it's uh I don't have quite as much wild space around me but there are a few a few parks that are you know 10 minute drives that I can get lost in well I I have very fond memories of going to Michigan to my great uncle's uh, farm and um, just just this thicket that you have uh, throughout the books this, uh, that, that you can barely see through, um, that, that is something that I, I have memories of. And the snow, um, and even in the fall, like all the, the, the leaves changing colors. I mean, yeah. we have a lot of that epic stuff over here on the West Coast, but there's something about Michigan where it's, it's just thick. There's just this, this yeah. um, impenetrableness to it. And we always vacationed when I was a kid. We vacationed, or not always, but a lot of the time, we vacationed on uh, the west side of Michigan, which is up against Lake Michigan. Yeah. Um, 
and all the way from about the midway point of, uh, you know, we can use our hand as our mi- as our map, but about <laughs> midway across your palm, all the way north up to your pinky, and then all the way up to the tip of the middle finger where the, the Mackinac Bridge is, anywhere along there is just perfect mouse guard setting yeah <laughs> it's that's it's where great. to go folks if you yeah. want to find well, the mice for mouse guard you, there it is you very much can find uh there are specific trees that i've drawn that i know exactly Ooh. where they are in michigan um just south of ludington there's uh some, the shoreline with the conrad scene yeah um, is all very much based on buttersville beach again just south of ludington that's awesome um yeah so when do you start the Mouse Guard uh, tours? You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we will wear costumes, David. Yeah, you can oh, start man, building huts me. and little things out there. <laughs> we will LARP this. Yeah, we gotta, yeah. We gotta, yeah. Maybe the maybe when the theme park opens, we'll do that. <laughs> All right. So the next slide we have here. This is uh, one of the the covers from the single issues. Uh, I think it's issue four of Winter. And um, it's it's Saxon laying on the pile of bones the bats drop him yes. into. Yes. And uh, today I was looking at it and I discovered on the back the back part of the cover the Millennium Falcon <laughs> nestled in the bones. And um, oh, I just found it. That's just, amazing. It? I have it's, never it's seen great. that. And and I love I love these about these books. They're so textured. The texture again is like the the uh, the thicket in Michigan. It's just it's there. <laughs> it's thick. It it lends so much to the tone. And this is a great little Easter egg. Yeah, this is like insanely detailed oh. like unbelievably so like how long does this take you to pen out some of that kind of stuff when it's things like that is it's deceptively complicated it's it's not or it's it's yeah it it seems deceptively complicated um when it's kind of like just a repetition of forms right um it's just about getting into like a, a, a Zone, zen groove yeah. with it and you just mm-hmm. do it and you just all of a sudden you're like i'm all i'm you know two-thirds away two thirds of the way across it. If you have to start worrying about other tangents or is this character visible? Am I getting, you know, am I getting a sense of depth or whatever? Mm. But when it's like, I just have to draw a field of clovers. I just have to draw a bunch of grass. I just have to draw a pile of bones. It really isn't as, as detailed as, or as, as complicated to draw as it might seem. Um, yeah, the, that, that cover was, uh, I loved doing that one because the, the where we leave Saxon at the end of issue three is he's disappeared into the distance and we don't know where he is. Um, he's he's uh, he's kind of hopped onto the back of a bat that he was fighting right. and yep. he's flown off into the distance. They're they're down in these tunnels that have no light. Kenzie's the only one who has a lantern. Classic so Saxon. He just whoo, and he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the first view that an audience is getting to see. You know, they're they're seeing the cover even before they've opened the oh. issue. Of, and so I purposely have him coiled up there in a way that we don't know if he's alive or dead. It's great. Um, and then obviously the visuals of all the bones like that doesn't yeah. bode. That, that's not good. That's a whole <laughs> lot of not good. Yeah. The Millennium Falcon, uh, I put in there thinking essentially no one would see it because at the time... Uh, all of the all of the uh, company logo and the company URL and the barcode and stuff oh, yeah. went on the back cover. And I had looked at previous issues uh, for where that was going to be. And I was like, cool, I can hide something there. Oh. And no one would know. <laughs> they they moved the barcode and URL. It was like it was centered at one point, and then they left justified everything or right justified. I can't remember which. How funny! Uh, at, at some point, and so it was instantly visible on the comic cover. And then, for some reason, even though we had already published the fall hardcover, where we collect all the covers without mm-hmm. any, you know, type or anything on them, I didn't think about that. And it also appears in the winter book, you know, right. separately without any uh, logo or title treatment. And I was like, <laughs> and now everybody, when they see it, they ask. Like, it's a deeper clue. Does it mean something? Yeah. And it's kind of, it goes to that. Human. Is this part of the? Is this part of the human world? <laughs> yeah. is this, uh, and I'm is like, there a spinoff where Han goes to a planet? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> these are giant mice. Mice. <laughs> Yeah. Are there like, Ewoks? Oh, I didn't. And that is, yeah. And it's like I don't want to answer the questions about it because what you think you're asking the question about isn't what it is. It was just a fun like. 
Wee, I'm hiding something. <laughs> um, and yeah, I used and I used I used to hide more things like that. Like there there is a there's the silhouette of an at at in in fall somewhere. Oh, cool. There's a Han and there's a Han and Luke mouse in in uh, fall. Uh, oh, I, I say the at at's in fall. The at at's in winter. Um, I think actually no. Yes. Anyways, there's there's stuff. Um, there are things hidden like that. Ooh. And and now I don't like doing that. I like putting things in that are um, they are going to be references to other mouse guard things. It's oh, like okay. If I want oh, cool. the audience yeah. searching for stuff, I want it to be a link to a different mouse guard story. Maybe it's one of the legends. Like, ooh, maybe that legend from the tavern was true. Because look, that object is there. Kalanwi was here. Yeah. Stuff so like here's that. a question. Have you ever put a mouse guard in a different issue for something else? Oh, yeah. Be like, take that, Spider-Man 10. There's Liam. <laughs> Saxon riding <laughs> on his back. Little um, axe. I have, on a Ninja Turtles cover, it was a, a, um, a Donatello solo issue cover. Um, and I have him working in his, you know, like sewer workshop. And I, I grew up in a, a oh. basement workshop. My my dad had been a shop teacher before I was born, but was kind of a just jack of all trades. He could build or fix anything. So I had access to all that stuff. But it was a it was like a basement shop. And instead of going and buying welding rod, we used metal coat hangers. Like it was just yes. that kind of a thing. Awesome. So I'm like, I'm going to draw Donatello's shop the way that my dad's shop was set up. But instead, like he had to scavenge everything there was no going to the hardware store and so it's just this like it's just a pile of junk all stacked up and stuff and i thought he's gonna also have a collection of books like his stool isn't a stool it's two milk crates stacked on top of each other yes but he's gonna yes. use the milk crates as bookshelves so he's sitting on his own little bookshelf i've hidden mouse guard books in in there <laughs> uh, yeah. I actually, on on that cover i also hid a usagi yojimbo sticker awesome yes uh. i hid um one of those one of those things that of the plot masters project that jesse and i did uh that was our ninja turtles was called cats trio <laughs> i put a cats trio poster on Donatello's oh, wall. That's fantastic. That that's their Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I've, I've hidden some things. Um, it's not usually mice. Usually it's a mouse guard book or something like that. Um, that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. I yeah. got to do, there was a, a, a tribute book for Usagi Ojimbo that Dark Horse published at one point. Um, and I had Usagi going into um, a city. Uh, and standing guard at the gates of the city were mice, but I drew them as mice as they would appear in Usagi, more human bodies, but with mm -hmm. mouse heads. Um, and I very clearly made one of them Kenzie and one of them Saxon. Oh. That's oh. awesome. But, it, but they are they are dressed in, uh, you know, Japanese appropriate time period, appropriate, you know, Usagi lore right. kind of costuming. But one of them's red. One of you know, one of them has red clothing. One of them has blue. One of them has a sword. One of them has a staff. That's um, awesome. That's yeah, Saxon Kenzie. So I, I've I've hidden that in there. Although I don't know how much hidden that is. Well, well Usagi childhood favorite right there. Oh yeah, awesome. Yep. Well, speaking of uh, workshop, uh, you you make a lot of maquettes and models to help you figure mm -hmm. out your environments and stuff like that. It, it, I remember seeing that with uh, James Gurney, who I think did the forward on your on your um, winter winter mm -hmm. uh book which that was that was like a, a nexus of like my favorite things dinotopia <laughs> the guy who did dinotopia did the yeah. forward to dinosaurs to, and to, animals to mouse guard i was like i was like another <laughs> hero of mine and and it's funny because when you look at his process he does a lot of those maquettes too and so i i just want to like ask how did you develop um that process of of making the maquettes to uh help your environments I started making them out of really flimsy stuff um, just very quickly, really like just cut Bristol board. Um, and it was if I had to show some piece of architecture from a, um, a complicated angle or maybe I had to show a room uh, three panels in a row that w had, you know, kind of a specific look. It was handy to have that thing and then photograph it from that angle. So instead of having to draw vanishing points off the, you know, off the edge of the page or. This is also in the era before, you know, Google SketchUp style yeah. programs were available to us. If you, if I wanted to get serious, I could have gotten into CAD um, at that era. But there, there weren't as many, like, easy-to-use 
uh, 3D modeling kind of things. So I, I, you know, I'm used to doing things in that basement shop and doing things with my hands. And so I would like the the portcullis coming down in fall, where I have you know the gates of Lock Haven and this portcullis is coming oh, down. That was I wanted it. I wanted it from a view like you are standing in front of the doors, looking up at the portcullis as it's coming down. This kind of extreme perspective. Um, so I just made a little portcullis out of out of like index card style paper. I just cut out all the little squares that would be openings, and I drew on little bolts, and I I kind of taped it with masking tape into an arch that I also cut out, and then I photographed it uh, with back back before our cameras were phones with a with a digital <laughs> camera. Yeah, yeah, there um, you go. And then I was able to trace that to to get all the geometry right. Um, but as I went, it's, like I said, using a room uh, model for something where I have a scene, uh, I might get done with that scene, but then maybe an issue or two later where I find I need to go back. Well, I didn't build the thing well enough. I built it out of, you know, really flimsy paper and tape. And so now it's sagging under its own weight. The tape has lo- lost its stickiness. It's, you know, the whole thing's falling apart. Um, and I just kept making the models more and more to last and more and more functional you know if you if you build a whole room uh with with the roof so that you can get like the roof beams and all four walls well now i can't get in there how can i see what i want to see so i build it like a sitcom set where the walls yes awesome (laughs) modular i can pull the walls i can pull two of the walls away and the roof will still stay on yeah so now it's an engineering challenge to make models that I can uh, <laughs> nice. I can keep so, that, that last because if I need to go back to that place two issues later or even a series later, I can just pull the model off yeah, the show. That's consistent, yeah. Well, yeah, now the, the stop motion uh, mouse guard movie is one step closer to reality. That's right. You have all your props. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and speaking of uh, reality, um, your critters are so well balanced between reality and just the minor tweaks of of humanity um in their faces i'm just i'm really curious how do you capture that human element because they do look like mice i mean a lot of the creatures just look like creatures but you do such a good job of conveying emotion still in their in their faces and so i'm just curious if you have a technique or if it's just you know something stylistic that you've kind of had um with you since you started drawing these characters. Uh, yeah. You really I mean, capture those mannerisms. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I always wanted them to be mice. I didn't want to draw, you know, I didn't want to do the Usagi or Robin hood style thing right. where they were kind of human bodies and human anatomy, but with <clears throat> animal right. features. I didn't, I didn't want to go nothing against that. I love those other things. That's just yeah. not the story I wanted to write and draw. Right. Um, and it, and, and also the look of the mice has, has changed. Like it changes almost every book. There's, there's subtle changes that start happening. And the way I draw them now is so different from how I drew them then. Um, but in general, I'm always trying to keep them looking like a critter rather than a human anatomy thing. But some of that means like the eyes, you know, we get a lot of, exp- if you were drawing human characters or if I was going the Usagi or Robin Hood route, things like eyebrows right, are used for a lot yeah. of expression uh, different kinds of things with the mouth and smirks and things like that. Well, if you think about, you know, most people don't have a, a mouse that they've studied, but if you look at like a dog or a cat, you know, their mouth is kind of on the underside of their chin. Right. So getting the kind of normal mouth cues that as humans, we recognize mm-hmm. to mean like, oh, he's telling a lie or, ooh, he's really proud of himself or, ooh, he's sad or he's cringing. It's hard to get that when the anatomy of the mouth is so like long right. and deep and kind of on the underside of the the head. Uh, so I end up trying to get a lot of emotion through very subtle eye shape changes and then body language. It's more yeah. about them almost miming the entire expression with their whole body or their hands yeah. um, than it is about like a facial kind of a thing. One of the things Which I noticed a- with like Liam is his ears will will portray like his emotion pretty well like when he yeah. is crawling out of the river and he's all soaked and and looking and terrible or you know that that one part where he decides to fight the snake and his ears flatten and he gets all hard you know it's like yeah. I, yeah. I love those the, the, i feel like the ears are a good cue too well it's a great it's a it's a really cool you know 
subtle brain exercise because That's there true. are different ways we read people, different ways we we see emotions, and it's true because you know, like like you just said, I wasn't even sure why I was picking up on some of these emotions. I'm just looking at these characters. I'm like, their eyes are two beads. Like, you know, I, wh- why can I tell that he's feeling this way? And I, it it is that. I did shrink down. Like, when you look at the first time you see oh, Saxon yeah. Kenzie and Liam in issue one, it's a kind of a three-panel shot, and it has their names underneath them. Their eyes are really big. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was because I was looking more at how real mouse anatomy is. You know, they, they have these kind of, in proportion to their heads, rather large eyes. Um, as I went on, I found it was it was harder to do subtle changes, like to, to make a change to that eye shape so that it looked angry, so that it looked more surprised, so that it looked sad. I was having to change so much of that shape. It's a big shape. You have to do a big change to make it look different. Um, and it looked, it, that started to almost look cartoony. So I yeah. found that as I went, if I shrunk the eyes down, just a subtle change, just a little bit of shape difference, I could get a lot more mileage out of it. So well, tinier eyes actually did help for me. Yeah, and that really lends to that style. And, and that kind of brings me to this question is, what is it? Because one of the cool things about the books is at the end you see all this fan art. And then you've got the the tales of the mouse guard mm-hmm. or, or the legends of the, of the guard where you've got other artists doing um, mouse guard stories. What is it about these characters and this style that just makes you want to draw. I mean, for me, it's like you just want to pick up and you want to draw this, you know, sword wielding puff ball. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I, and it kind of also leads to the game, but like, what is it about that, that, that makes you want to pick up a pen and, and, and make your own, uh, guardsman mouse. Uh, I mean, I think we've been tell as human beings, we've been telling stories with animals, as personifications of emotions or whatever since you know before the written language that you know there's an oral tradition of telling stories and then you even go back to like aesop's fables being you know some of the earlier ones that were then eventually written um but going all the way through all the stuff that you've talked about with wind of the willows and secret of nim and uh disney's robin hood uh and then you know the one that mouse guard gets uh kind of talked about with the most is Redwall. You know, there's a whole generation oh, yeah. of kids who grew up yeah. on the Redwall books before this. So I think there's just a, a soft place in our hearts where this is, this is part of our history as humans. Um, I think the mouse part, the, the mouse specific stuff goes into what I said earlier about, you know, everyone knows what it's like to yeah. feel very small and very vulnerable in a very big world. Um, <clears throat> And that can be whether it's about, you know, things, how things are going at school or how things are going at work or your own personal ambitions. Everyone's felt tiny. And uh, and I think we all like the idea of seeing a little version like that who's still picking up the sword and growling. Yes. yes. You know, like yes. we all want to kind of go like, yeah, you're not going to stop me. I'm still I'm going to put on this cloak and I'm going to hold this sword up and you can't kill my spirit. Um, so I think that's a universal thing and I'm really lucky that there are enough professional people out there who wanted to, and agreed to, to do those pinups and agreed to do the legends of the guard stories. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a, it's a, I think it's some, I tapped into something that's a universal thing. Uh, luckily. I mean, and that, I think too, another reason why it appeals to, to children. I mean, my son, you know, especially that that image of the little guy making his way in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, little kids are obviously the, you know, perfect version of like, they are little in a very big world. You know, we, we as adult, you know, men don't necessarily have it so tough, but we've all felt that emotion, but kids are literally tiny little things. And, and, as adults, we're also the ones telling them, no, no candy before dinner or no, you can't, or put down that sword. You can't I'm the go bear. out for resource. You can't, or you can't go out for for recess. You have to stay inside, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. You you committed to the Boy Scouts. Now you have to go to the meetings every week. You know what? Or are you committed to the trumpet and you have to practice every day, or whatever it is. Like right. we're that thing where they're like, oh, oh, my life is so horrible. Wow. I don't have any control of my own life. Yeah. So kids totally get it. Yeah. Now, speaking of 
um, children. Since I was a child, I've loved, loved board games, role-playing games. So my, my introduction to Mouse Guard was yes. I went to uh, this giant uh, game store in Portland, and I spied this Mouse Guard role-playing game box oh, set so on cool. the shelf. And Explain I just looked at the cover. Explain it. So, so you have this beautiful square box, and on the cover, you've got three mice battling a fox. And oh, look at fox that fox. Arrows <laughs> and it's so snout. Good. It's so good. It just it just caught me so off guard. I'd never heard of this. This is before I knew about the books. Um, I love the art style. And it was it was seventy dollars. And I wrestled with it. And I wrestled with it because I didn't have the money that's to a, spend. That's a commitment. <laughs> I was like, uh, what am I going to do? I can't, I can't, I can't not do it. So I, I took it home and I popped it open. And this box is filled with so many goodies. Yes. I, I think this goodies. is the best bang for your buck on a role playing game I've ever purchased. And I've spent so many hours on this thing. Uh, so many hours of enjoyment. Oh, good. Um, breaking the rules where <laughs> mice find uh, oil drums left by Uh-oh. humans inhabited by octopuses they have to fight. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's just awesome and it's a great time. So when when did you get the invite? Like, How did this come about? Uh, did someone contact you and say, hey, I got a great idea for a role-playing game with your art on it? Or where you've talked quite a bit about role-playing games, mm-hmm. so it sounds like you might play yourself. Was this an idea while you were uh, working on your comics, thinking, oh, this would be a cool role-playing game? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think... I, I had ever ruled it out, but I wasn't like the pie in the sky dream. When I first started working on this, this comic was, I wonder if enough people will buy it that I can break even and or do <laughs> another issue. I wonder yeah. if I can pay for my table fees at the convention. That would be True. really cool. You know, it'd be even cooler than that. What if, what if I could find a way to get my comic in stores? Like those were yeah. the big dreams. The yeah. going like, and then what if it was also a role playing game and we had merchandise? And yeah, yeah, that was I. I was not there, but I, I certainly wasn't going to rule it out. And I grew up playing role playing games. I think they, I credit them with um, probably the best storytelling lessons that I ever had. Yeah, um, definitely. Ev- everyone at the table and any role playing game you you can at a distance watch the table and you can know if the story of the adventure is good or not uh because everyone's either uh uh emoting something or they're just sitting there flaccid absolutely and, you yeah know, even if bad things are happening to the characters they are edge of their seat they're going no crap and then they're talking to the person next to them yeah. going, when it's your turn, make sure that you grab the scroll or whatever, <laughs> yeah. right? They are passionate. We are going to get through this game. It's exciting. It's a good story. When everybody's just kind of like, uh-huh, okay, well, I guess my character um, goes to the library and tries to research uh, research more about that topic <laughs> so that maybe that way we get to know more, I guess. You know, like boring boring story yeah. you can learn so much both as a player and a game yep. master about how to how to tell better stories through role playing um i had two good benefits going in before the mouse guard role playing game stuff happened one was that mark smiley who was head of arcaea at the time mm-hmm. had done his own role playing game for artesia for, oh, cool. for his book okay so i already knew that the publisher would be open to something like this. Like if I went, Hey Mark, let's do a mouse guard role playing game. He, he knows exactly what that entails. He knows That's what great. That, you know, like he's there. Um, the other thing was I had fans after issue one came out going, is this a role? This is a role playing game, right? Is this based on a role playing game? They almost, did it again. They did that with the like start of mouse guard. <laughs> when I had the, the character art out, people went, is this a book? People went, this is a board. This is a, this is a role playing game, right? There's a role playing system for this, right? You know, no. But now I know that the fans would buy one if we put one out. Yes. So it I isn't was right contacted. Now. Uh, yeah, I was contacted by somebody um, who proposed a role playing game. Uh, they kind of proposed how this, how, like, they had a system already. It was an indie game designer. They had a system that worked already. Um, and they said, "Hey, w- what about this?" And I looked it over and I went, "I don't know that that really fits." And I. I put in some suggestion you know this is kind of how i would see it going uh got some weird pushback and then it just kind of went nowhere 
Uh, I was then at the New York Comic Convention, and Mark Smiley introduced me to an independent game designer named Luke Crane. Now, Luke Crane knew this other individual, and so during this dinner uh, that we were having, just as, you know, let's let's get together after the show is over, Luke was kind of there, uh, not not on the orders of this other designer, just Luke's own personal thing going, I think you should give this guy another try. I, I, I'm a fan of Mouse Guard, but I think... I think this other guy gets it enough. I think you need to have some faith in his system. And I'd go, but what about this part of his system? Or what about this kind of thing? <laughs> this, this didn't feel right. And Luke and I would start uh, arguing and debating and talking about what makes a good role-playing game and what and game design stuff of what's the responsibility of the rules and what are the responsibilities of the players and, and, and things that we hated about role-playing games and things that we loved about role-playing games. And by the end of it, Luke could kind of, I think, tell I wasn't budging off of the, this first guy was the wrong fit. In my head, the whole time, I'm going, this is the guy you. I need to write my role. Yeah. You! <laughs> and yeah, at the very end of the night, Luke said, well, look, I, you know, I still think this other guy, I, I know him. He puts out good games. I think you should, you know, talk to him again. Because uh, apparently... The independent game designer didn't like the idea that a comic book artist was telling him how to write and design an independent game, which is totally fair because I wouldn't like right. a game designer telling me how to make a comic. Right. But it also meant it just wasn't going to be a relationship that fit. Um, and so Luke said, you know, I, I still think you should give him another shot. But if that doesn't work, <laughs> I I do games for myself, so I, I'm not... I didn't come here to try to do that, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm playing yeah. it real cool, but in my head, I'm like, I hired you an hour and a half ago when we were talking, <laughs> yes. about, we were talking about inventory control in role-playing games. Yeah. So, Lady and the yeah, Tramp, you to, push the meatball over. I it, talked to it, Mark Smiley It was that moment. It. Yeah, I talked to Mark <laughs> Smiley about it after everyone had dissipated from the dinner, and I'm like... So remember how we talked about a role-playing game? <laughs> that guy that you invited for dinner? I think we need to get him in on that. I think yeah. he's number the one guy. Yeah. Hooked him like a and, crab. Uh, and yeah, that doesn't mean that Luke and I always agree on things. But um, I love disagreeing with Luke on things. Because um, we come we come to a mutual understanding about great. why we feel those things. And it, and it really works. Um, and Luke did a fantastic job of summarizing ideas about what Mouse Guard is about because it's not about combat. I've had in the oh, past video yes. game companies and you know go like, oh, we'd like to do a game based on Mouse Guard, and they start describing a combat game, and it's like that's not that's not who they are. Yes, there are times there are these epic, cool moments where they kill a snake, where they kill an owl, where they uh, whatever, yeah, but say. that's not the meat of the of what they do right. that's not what the guard is it's not just going out and slaughtering wildlife um <laughs> you can't do a combat game it has to be these yeah. other things it almost has to be a stealth game that occasionally has combat well right. the best my and i think one of my favorite elements actually my favorite element of the game because i me and uh Brent engineer have played this many times for many hours many hours many hours but it starts to rain, and you're like, cool, so what? It's raining. <laughs> and then it's like, no, it really starts to rain, and you're in combat, but you're not fighting. You're you're literally fighting the weather. It is right. the yeah. coolest mechanic ever. And you're like, yes. holy crap, get up on rocks. Do we have some leaves? Yeah. Who has boat craft? Yes. Uh, like, it's <laughs> How are we going to do this? Yes, Sk skills are the thing that define who your character is in part. There's also the thing that's that's unique to you know Luke's games where you declare something about your character at the beginning that's like a belief. Um, yes. You know, who oh, they yeah. are. Uh, you declare it at the start of the adventure, and then if you go against that, it's it's the and this is like something that uh, it didn't come out of our conversation because he already had it in his games. But we talked about the thing where you're role playing, except people don't actually yeah. role play, so they create yeah. this character that's maybe. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, lawful. Let's say it's a lawful good character, but then they need to do something that's not quite so lawful. There are mechanics in those other games to punish them, but how often does that actually come up? How how often mm -hmm. does someone actually go, "Hey, that goes against it"? And part of it's right. because it's it's defined as this vague lawful good, right? But in Mouse Guard, you spell out something about your character. Yes. Yeah. That's very specific. 
I will always help my friends before I help myself. I will always do this. I will never do that. I will never let my friends fail if I can stop it. There are things like that you declare when you make your character. So if in the middle of the game you do something against that, it is very obvious how that you can still do that. You can say, hey, this is the exception. This or this is the moment where my character makes a turn. Maybe they're turning. They're not yep. they're not the same character anymore. But there are rules not to force them into a lane, but that there are consequences for the action. So that defines your character, your skills define your character, and then this is the this is the part that, you know, it's not all about combat. Uh, that that I love. It's 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 an anti min max kind of strategy for role playing. It's that to advance a skill, to advance your character, you not yeah. only have to have a certain number of successes, you have to have a certain number of failures. I oh, loved that. That was so, so it's cool. Not it's like you learn just about always doing it the best, maxing out perfect yeah. every time. That's not your goal. Your goal is to advance the story, and you do that sometimes by failing. Yeah. And that's and, all Luke. I can't take credit for that. Like I'm I'm saying it with this <laughs> conviction like it's me. It, that's Luke. That's why like Luke did this great job. We talked about the age group too, the age range for mouse guard. Like we say 8 to 80 is the age range yeah. for for reading mouse guard. And really, yeah. I've had fans that are older than 80 and I've had fans that are younger than 8, but with Luke I went, "Hey, you've got this this task of writing a role-playing <clears throat> game system that needs to be accessible to kids." But I don't want to abandon the 30 and 40 somethings that are old school gamers who might want to play this. Yeah. And you have to reconcile that. Yeah. And he did a fantastic job. Yeah. yeah. It's as crunchy and as deep as you want it to be. Uh, I think we upped the age. I think we said like 11 or 12 yeah. can play as long as there's an adult there kind of walking them through everything. Uh, but yeah, he 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 pulled somehow he pulled that off yeah i mean it's an immersive game like i said uh hours and hours some of my most memorable role-playing sessions uh came out of mouse guard so that's um, awesome thank you yeah it's great great game um so my last question on this topic is if you were a mouse in the world of the guard what would your profession and life be yes (laughs) uh Wow. Um, I mean, it's kind of weird for me because, you know, Saxon is the character that is based on me the most. Uh, Saxon is based on some of my worst traits, actually. Um, so there are things that I've infused into Saxon that are that are me. Um, but within the pages of the Mouse Guard comic, there, there's also a there's a mouse that lives in the basement of the June Alley Inn who's a printmaker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is also very much me. That's, you know, like that's my non sword wielding yeah. side. That's just like I'm just living a life. Um, so if I'm a guard mouse, I'm probably something more like Saxon, but hopefully not as aggro and, and <laughs> you know, <Head> strong, <laughs> d- dumb, strong, dumb, headstrong, like <laughs> leap, leaping before you look. Um, yeah. Uh so, so probably something a little bit like Saxon, a, to- a slightly, to- hopefully slightly toned down Saxon. Um, <laughs> yeah, all or I'm nothing. Just, if I'm just getting to live my my civilian life, you know, some kind of some kind of craft where I work with my hands, yeah, some kind of carpentry or or lore keeper, any, any of those things really, carpentry, printmaking, um, stained glass work. I've I've done all. No, I haven't done those professionally, but I've done those enough where i have yeah. finished objects that people recognize as you know no, nobody looks at a bookcase i built and goes what's that it's yeah it's it looks like a finished per- piece of furniture you could purchase at a store uh, stained glass same kind of thing um, so i've done all of those things i enjoy them um so yeah if i just got to live out my peaceful life probably probably something in that vein i love Crafting that something. Yeah. yeah yeah and those those crafts have really like you know which, you know, obviously it seems like they're pieces of you. Those have definitely found themselves both in Mouse Guard, oh, but I they also that. live on in the role-playing game, which is really cool because, you know, I don't do all those crafts, but I love the idea that I can take on those roles and I can make boats. 
and yeah. I can, you know, it's yeah. so it, it's a really well, cool there, thing to give people. There's an it, this comes into that whole storytelling part of of role playing as opposed to combat and stats, um, and, and there's a there's a mechanic in Mouse Guard that you can help as a, as a as a side character. You can you can say to the game master, "I'm going to help them with that action." And you go, okay, well, how, what craft are you, like, are you going to go, I can, um, I can add uh, a die to their roll with, um, with my basket weaving. Yeah. And the game master might even be like, how? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. But if you can, it's, it, in a little way, it's a, like, you know, lawyering in, in magic where you lawyer your way <laughs> through the, like, the rules. But it's, it's like, in role playing, you're, you're telling a story. You're, you're explaining mm-hmm. how that basket craft is helping when we when we play tested the game we were confronted with an owl and it was at night um and there was just no way there was we no way we were gonna hit this thing it was so bad we had to all pile in for you know like <laughs> this person's helping with this thing and this person's help and we were still like not gonna get there and i went cannot can my character use um can, can i add a die using stargazing and luke was running it and luke kind of did a like funny you know skeptical face and was like um david explain to me how stargazing is helping you take out this owl (laughs) i was like my character is so familiar with the heavens he knows the point of where every star should be at any time of night and so as the owl is flying around he would become aware of which stars or constellations are blacked out oh man that's so great. <laughs> I have a way of tracking this thing at night. And he's like, yeah, I'm giving you a die for that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Right? And now it's a storytelling Badass. thing. It's not just a stat. It's not just a like, hey, I get plus one. It's a storytelling thing. And I think yeah, all right. of those crafts can be used in unexpected ways. Ba- whether it's basket weaving or stained glass, there's aspects to, you know, knowing something about solder or hot, uh, heating something up or cutting glass or breaking glass or how something was made if you need to disassemble it or how to make a fake one if you need to swap a real one out. You know, there's so many ways that those things can happen, whether it's stained glass or basket weaving or carpentry or cooking uh, you know, bread making, all that stuff is is just perfect fodder for getting you to creatively think, how can I use this skill to help me? You know, if, if you've ever seen uh, people have to knead dough uh, yeah. for yeah. the masses, like if you're a, not just a baker, like, Forums. oh, I'm making a loaf for home, but like, yeah, we're making enough dough <laughs> so that there's bread in the morning for the town. And you've seen those, those yeah. groups knead dough. If your character has bread making, I think you can ask for dice if there's any kind of strong operation. Yeah. <laughs> like if it's like I need to push or grip or hold on or break something small with your hands, go I'm a I'm a bread maker. I've got a I've got a this, this number. Look at these mitts. Yeah, I've yeah, got a three yeah. in bread making. Clearly my character has enormous <laughs> forearms and has Popeye arms and grip. Like yeah. I can wield yeah. a rolling pin like no one's business. Yeah. Those <laughs> things those things are more than just Oh, I'm a baker. Yeah. Well, th- this might be the the lasting legacy of of Mouse Guard. I think that goes furthest into the future. I mean, when we were researching for the the interview, I go I go on to YouTube. I go on and and almost the first thing that always came up were people playing the game on YouTube or and had a podcast that was completely about playing um, Mouse Guard and. Uh, um, I you know many people being introduced to the world of Mouse Guard through this game and you know th- this this may be the thing that that um, carries into the future the furthest. Yeah, I mean it probably will be. It probably will be because anybody can continue to tell their stories, right? Whether I'm here or not. So moving on to um, some of your other stories that you've contributed art to yes, uh, on our tenth we slide. Have to leave the world. Of Mouse Guard. Yeah. Yes. That's, That's right. Sort of. You have to drive it's, out of Michigan. We're, we're still right. looking at some critters, and um, yeah. man, are we looking at a nasty critter here. We That's are looking so at a very small mansion with a That's... very peculiar key stuck into it. <laughs> Behind is a big old web, and crawling atop this mansion is a gigantic uh, black widow, I'm going to call it. 
It's I, I, it's got different shaping on the back, but it is a horrifying spider. This is not something you want to look at if you're an arachnophobe. Yeah. Um, and this is a cover for uh, Lock and Key. Um, one of the I, remind us inks which which this was for. I can never remember. This is a uh, small world. Small, small world. world. Thank you. Um, and you've got some amazing uh, sketches of your process here. Um, but what I wanted to ask you about, uh, and something that I think is really valuable for people listening, how do you go about getting a bid on some of these projects? Because uh, I know for a lot of people who are trying to become artists who want to do this, uh, where do you start? And so do publishers contact you uh, because you have street cred or do you, you know, seek them out with something you want to do? Like, Oh, I love lock and key. I want to do something for it. Do you have anything? It, it can go both ways. Um, uh, I think reaching out going, Oh, I love, I love lock and key. You I want to do something. You're probably going to be better off if you're reach, if, if you have some kind of a relationship with either Joe or Gabe, like the, it's a creator right. book, if you know whether it's locker key or whatever, if you know the creator and you ask, you know, and also just as, as someone who is a creator and has people ask the, the nicest way to always do that, especially if you're friends with the person yeah. <laughs> is to not say, can I, because now that requires a yes or no answer. The way yeah. you do it is you go, if you ever wanted me to do a cover, I would be happy to please oh, let me know okay. or keep me in mind. That's because great. Then me not reaching back out could be we didn't have a slot for you or it could be you're no. not the right fit. It's not personal. Right. But then I don't I don't have to be the bad guy. But it, it really can go every every way. Um, I'm my story is that Mouse Guard was the first thing I really ever did. It blew up. I had cred over that, and then right. other publishers kind of went, what if we got the Mouse Guard guy to do a cover for this thing? What if we got the Mouse Guard guy to do a cover for that thing? And then the more covers I did, the more that ballooned out. Um, but I know uh, I know that publishers sometimes want to find new talent. They want to they want to try them on things like covers. Um, and that... that uh, just having a good portfolio and I mean, if you can reach out to a publisher, if you have a portfolio up um, and a portfolio should be concise, it should show, it should not be a Swiss army knife approach where it's like, Hey, look at all the things I can do. Here's my pottery and here's <laughs> <laughs> bread making. I, I, yeah. I can, or I can, I can render, <laughs> I can render in pencil, soft pencil, but here's my really digital stylized stuff that looks like propaganda posters. And here's my, <laughs> you know, and here's, here's my super detailed ink work. And here's yeah. no, it needs to have one artistic voice. It needs to be accessible. If you want to do more than covers, have sequentials, have backgrounds. Don't just have okay. floating characters. That's something yes. that okay. I, I've talked with about editors before where sometimes we're looking for new talent and it's the heartbreak where we find somebody, sometimes it's like on Instagram or something. And we yes. go, oh my God, this person's amazing. And then you look at their portfolio or you look at their body of work on, on social media and you go, it's, it's just a character floating on a white background though. They don't have oh. anything that's showing a scene or a moment or an environment or acting. That's it's always just... my qualm with, with, with these, <laughs> these artists on Instagram. It is, it is. And, and some of them, I, I, it's, but it's true. Poor I, I follow, Dude, that... I follow a lot of these, these, these folks and they're great and they're super talented, but I'm like, why did you put this luscious, amazing warrior behind a white background? You've, well, there's, so you have so much opportunity. There's, so there's a couple answers of why that can be a good idea. One is it actually works into uh, Instagram and you getting more views because yes. it's instantly readable. Yeah. And then right. you're going to get more interactions and the algorithm is going to favor you and you're going to become an Instagram art star. Um, that's where you're going to become famous. You're not going to necessarily get the other gigs. There are also gigs where your job is to draw characters. True. And that's it. Like. To, if you are a character designer for the movie industry or the video game industry, now most of those places are also going to want you to have experience doing other things because sometimes they might need to shuffle departments or they might need to say, we need this character interacting with this thing. And if they don't see that, that might hurt you. But there is a job where you're just supposed to do that. But for, for comic book people going, hey, we want to hire this person to do a cover. 
Yeah. Or to do interiors. Yeah. It, you you got to have a good portfolio out there. And then you just reach out to the editors. Used to be you'd go to see them at conventions. Obviously, right now we're not doing that. But yeah, reach out to them <laughs> on social media or, or find an official email and just say, you know, I'm so and so. This is my artwork. I, I love the books that you publish. Don't come up with one stock, uh, you know, form letter. Tailor it to who you're talking about, talking to. Talk about maybe some of the titles that they have that you like, or the tone of the books that they publish. Um, you know, I re- I really like how earnest your stuff is, or I really like how the the publication quality is. You guys have yeah. better better printing than any other uh, you know publisher in the industry. As I really appreciate that, and I love this title and this title, or I really love you know fill fill in the blanks. Write write something that's meaningful of why you want to work for this company. Um, I think at that point when you're not reaching out for it to be creator owned, uh, you can't get too specific. You know, if you're reaching yeah. out to IDW and you don't know specific creators, so let's say you really want to do, uh, I don't know, Ghostbusters covers, you know, you can go, Hey, I'm an artist. Here's my samples. I, I would, I have a real affinity for you. You guys publish Ghostbusters. I have a real affinity for, for drawing that kind of stuff. But obviously I think I could also potentially be a good fit for several other titles, including, Blah, 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 because of my color use or because of my uh, my, my my way of drawing monsters or my draw, right. way of drawing bad guys or my way of draw, capturing mood or whatever. Um, you know, please keep, you know, please take a look at my work and let me know if there's a chance we could ever work together. That's great. So That's so great. Publisher, publishers and editors, they they do want that stuff. They do seek that stuff. I think yeah. I feel like a lot of people feel like, what's the point? They, there's a million people you know, plumb in the depths and, you know, I'm never going to get seen that way. So they, I mean, so, you can also just, I mean, my route was I made my own comic franchise yeah. and then uh, yes. got work from that. So also like if you're feeling helpless, like no one's going to take your work seriously, put your own thing out there into the world. And if Boom. it gets attention, you'll also get attention, but that's a really hard way of doing it. Especially right. if your goal is I want to draw covers for other people because now right. you're just, you know, you're putting out a product that you don't really care about just to get attention. You you just need to. It's not impossible. Publishers want that stuff. The thing that pu- publishers don't want is unsolicited uh, uh, pitches. Right. And that's almost always just because of a legal issue now at this point. If if you can prove that you showed them something and then years down the road they come out with anything that looks anything remotely similar. Maybe your email was never even opened. Oh. They're still open to a lawsuit where you could go, hey, I had a character like that that I sent you guys and you never emailed back. And so now they just have a blanket thing. A lot of them have a blanket thing saying no unsolicited uh, submissions or, or samples. And and so it's like you have to kind of make a connection with an editor first and say, hey, I have a thing. Would you be interested? Or what's your submission policy? Or here's some of my other work. Would you ever be interested? And and sometimes that does work slowly out of like you got a little bit of a gig doing some pinups or doing some covers or doing a backup story yeah. or doing a single issue of something. And then now that you have a relationship with the editor, you can go, I actually have this story about, you know, whatever, cl- claymation characters that come to life or <laughs> s- s- snow- snowmen that never yeah. melt. Or, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. You, so you so going out. with your story, what would you say to someone who who is going that route who says, you know what? I, I'm tired of trying to do all this other stuff. I want to write, mm-hmm. illustrate, and mm-hmm. color my own comic. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. <laughs> what, what what advice would you give them for taking what I'm assuming is a painstaking, loving, amazing, Being probably your own art department? Yeah, painful experience. <laughs> do it. Yeah. Do it. That's actually the thing that's the hardest. Is that you spin your wheels forever. You start going, well, I'm still working on the story. Well, I, I don't draw consistently enough. Well, I need to get to this level. And they have some imaginary threshold of, of what their art level is going to be before they can start drawing it. Um, and they just don't. Or they go, I don't have a time. Or I'm not going to find a publisher. or I'm not. Excuse, excuse, excuse. Yeah, um, right. It, you there's, there's obviously some... some minimum thresholds for things if you can't draw a character consistently twice yeah that's going to be a problem but if a character evolves over the course that you've drawn them over 30 pages that's normal 
And the only way you're going to get to the point that you're drawing them consistently is you've done it that many times. And you might as well be telling some stories and getting some practice. Um, And also, don't weigh yourself down with too much story. Um, Have a a manageable story size. People who are just starting out, I mean, I, I my start was a 24 page comic um, and I wrote the first issue. I actually wrote it as like a 22 pager um, originally that was uh, closed like it was a single issue and that I thought, oh, I could do an issue two if I <laughs> wanted to. But as I got close to the end, I'm like, no, I need a hook. I don't want it just to be now. Here's another one. I need something from this one to lead into. And yeah, yeah so you did Conrad literally had a hook. Yeah, Conrad had a hook. <laughs> that's true. Well, that's that that true. was I was showing my wife Double that I was hook. like I was like look at this because I was showing her the part where the the mice are going through the town and asking questions and it's just yeah. image. There's no dialogue. You see the mm-hmm. different crafts mouses so doing yeah. their 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 works, yeah. and then they come back together and and I think it's Saxon that says no leads. Kinsey's like me neither, and I was like he just told. All the, a whole story, a <laughs> bunch of questions that he's asking all these mice with two bubbles, and uh, I thought that was a, a pretty brilliant way of of, um, Thank you. of advancing the story, and and you know, speaking of of your your specialty or your lane, it looks like you have become kind of the creature guy or the animal guy, um, <laughs> in yeah. in doing covers. I mean. Do you ever want to step out of that, or do you just love doing these creatures? I mean, the spider's incredible. I've got another slide up here of the Skeksis yeah, and, and so Uru good. that yes. you did. Oh, and, um, so cool. I mean, what a good specialty to have, but is there is there something that you're like, oh, I wish I could, I could, I could just try that? N- no, really. I mean, I do. I always feel like I'm better at getting the emotions out of other, other things. Mm-hmm. Um, there was I was hired like in terms of being typecast or pigeonholed. The the one that was the worst for that was there was a a Marvel kind of like an event, but I, think I it was saw just that for yeah. the, just for the covers. It wasn't the interiors. It was just for the covers where they went. We're gonna do a a year or a, or six months or something like that where every Marvel cover is gonna have a variant where it's that those those Marvel characters as animals. I loved that. <laughs> Um, and they hired me to do the first one with the idea that there might be more. And then everyone else was having such a fun time with it that when, by the time I finished the first one, they're like, yeah, we're actually booked up solid with everybody else. And I was like, well, I would have done more, but, um, yeah, I did. I got to draw Captain America as an Eagle and, uh, uh, Thor as a as an elk, I think that was the editor's, the elk was, that's right. was, (laughs) was, was, um, the editor's choice. Uh, and then Hulk was a bear. A uh, big green bear. Yeah. Um, yeah, nailed it. And it would have been fun. It would have been fun to go on with further ones with like a turtle for for Tony or whatever, you know, like and, and keep doing more. <laughs> but, yeah, I only got the one. But it was a little like, hey, let's hire if Marvel's calling. It's because there's animal covers. <laughs> um, I've also done a rocket raccoon cover. Yeah, for them, the rocket raccoon. That, that one feels like they didn't change the character into a raccoon so that I could draw it. They went, hey, we have an animal character. You should draw it. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, like I, I wouldn't mind, you know, if 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 Gabe or Joe asked me to do more lock and key covers, I don't think we'd have to relegate it to, uh, you know, some kind of baddie or some character right. using the animal key so that I can I can draw it. I I, I can draw the other stuff. Yeah. But in yeah. terms of going like, oh man, I never get the chance to draw likeness. Man, I'd I'd love to draw <laughs> some Star Trek comics where I could draw uh, Shatner's face. No, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Mouse Shatner. I mean, hu- human Star Trek with mice. <laughs> human human faces, likeness. It's not. It's not going to get the best work out of me. Yeah, I, yeah. I, like that brings me to the, this is cover of Bosk from Star Wars, and he looks so good and so dramatic and cool. He's this lizard man, you know, from from the Empire Strikes Back, I think. And yeah. like you've got him in this cover, just like ducking around the corner. Um, and that I was, was actually that was a trading card. Oh, it was a trading card. Okay. Yeah, that one's really small when it's actually printed. That's a trading card. Um, yeah, and you know your website, your blog, uh, yeah. folks. I'm going to link to the blog. You've got to check it out. It is a treasure yeah. trove of content. And 
you're really generous with showing your process. I mean, you take process shots from your sketches to your inks to your flat colors to your full colors. I, I mean, if if you want to start learning how to do this kind of stuff, I don't know a better place to start um, yeah. and stay for a few years. But uh, how are you able to create so much content and you know and and what what made you want to show your process uh, i knew fans were interested and yeah. then you know when i was when i was younger um and and following comics you know the internet was in its infancy it was it was dial up message boards and, and bbs's it wasn't even a graphical uh, a graphical interface yet for for the internet um you know the the world wide web was a series of menus it wasn't there was no clicking and using a mouse when I started. So, um, or when I, when I was a, a fan of comics trying to find out about, you know, how my, how my heroes did stuff. So anytime there was an art of book, like, a, like for a, oh, a Disney yeah. movie, an art of book where you got to see even like the character designs that were rejected or somehow became the version that we Love saw, that. like seeing that development or seeing a background painting without the characters on it. Um, all that kind of stuff from from whether it was a, a, a Disney making of kind of a thing or in back in Wizard magazine, there yeah. were drawing tutorials um, and they'd get different people to come in and show different processes and talk about that stuff. Um, Mignola is a hero of mine, and I still remember the one that he did about drawing a spooky graveyard. And it wasn't just about like a, how to draw like here's step one, here's step two. Yeah. It was talking about like. And these are the elements that go in, you know, think about this, think about atmosphere, think about yes. making things not completely solid. Think about making sure that the there's like a ground fog. How are you going to fade objects away so that we don't see where they touch the ground? Because if you show that, then you have to start drawing ground. And it's like, where do you stop? How do you fade that out? How do you get the feeling of fog? Um, it was about conceptual learning um, and seeing that kind of stuff. It was so important and so few and far between um that yeah and james gurney's blog was an influence oh. for me starting my blog gurney journeys um, he, yeah gurney journey <laughs> Gur james james gurney is a machine he who is. does a daily blog a daily blog mm -hmm. now sometimes it's not a lesson sometimes it's just him saying you everyone needs to check out this painter you know, here, here's the here's the wiki link. Here's even yeah. a quote. Here's a, here's one sample of their work. This is a painter, a Russian painter from the 19th century that everyone should be paying attention to. You know, go go do your research. But other times it's like, here's color theory. Let me yeah. break down <laughs> color theory for you. Yeah. Here, I'm going to show you how I made a video. Uh, not just my how I did my how to video, but I'm going to show you my um, my my behind this i had my wife filming me film yes the video yeah so yeah you I, can I saw see that one how I filmed the video. <laughs> he made a lego track for his tracking yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. here's my and kids holding a paper mache dinosaur <laughs> daily blog yeah he's a beast and i just went i can't i can't do daily but uh for a while i did blog posts whenever i had content and then i just got into a rhythm of going i should do them once per week so i have a weekly blog Sometimes mine are breakdown of tutorials, things where I, I show step by step. Other times it's like, here's a link to something. Yeah. <laughs> Go check it out. Or a discussion with someone. It's really cool to see because as, you know, artists, we, you know, and especially artists out there, a lot of times you look at, you know, folks who, you know, um, we had an interview earlier where, you know, oh, you, yeah, you, you talk about these folks, you see their art and you think like, Man, does like how do they even do this? They're just like these these god people that walk around on these artistic clouds and they just they just, you know, burp and there's art. <laughs> but there is such an an in-depth intricate process and it's really cool to see no, like you know, there 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 is a road that we take and mm -hmm. there are ways you do it and we've been doing it for a long time and you can literally draw this by following these steps. And yeah. it's just, it's so cool to see that. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes there's a demystifying quality to it where they're just like, Oh, I get it now. Um, and other times I think there's a magic to it. Like when you yeah. watch the, the Lord of the Rings, um, special yeah. features, the, the, oh, you know, yeah. those, those huge Three documentaries. Hours. Yeah. And, and you go, 
this should make this experience less magical, right? Like I just saw how the sausage was made, but instead you see all these amazing craftspeople and their dedication to yeah. it and all the work that goes into it. And maybe it even inspires you. Like I remember watching that and seeing how they made the, uh, the chain mail out of those plastic yes. rings that was actually just slices of tubing. And I'm like, hey, yep. I have access to tubing. I have access <laughs> to something I can chop tubing into. I could make chain mail. They're saying that's an easy way to do it. Cool. You know, like maybe something about yeah. my process when I'm showing it makes somebody go, oh, that's how you color. Yeah, that's how you. Oh, inking can be done that way. You can do it on a light box. OK, yeah. so I actually stream on Twitch now, too. Oh, um, which is a way that I get to show that process off. Oh. Um, people can ask questions. I can even do quick demos sometimes. Um, yeah, it's just a way of connecting with the fans and showing them i mean some ways some of this is um mouse guard takes a long time to do it's been a long time since there's been a new mouse guard book i want people to know i'm still alive and i'm still doing something <laughs> yeah. right and so if i post something and go here's what i've been working on here's new stuff i'm doing here's how the steps go or if i'm streaming on twitch i can interact with fans i can yeah. show them that i'm working they get to watch it and uh yeah so that will bring us to our, our final question for you, David. Yeah. Uh, what does the future hold for you uh, and perhaps even Mouse Guard in general? Is there yeah. anything you can, you want to, you want to, anyone you want to shout out, uh, anything you're working on? Uh, we just want to open this up for you to just, you know, sh- sh- spread it out there to whoever's listening. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing, um, I'm working on the next Mouse Guard book right now. Yes. Uh, it's called the Weasel War of Eleven Forty Nine. Yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's a book that I, I, you know, I've teased since the very beginning of the series. Um, and I had a, pl- I've always had a plan for what the the main arcs, the main thrust of the first five books would be. Um, and I, I, I put uh, Weasel War as the fourth one uh, for a reason. There, there is a. a progression that i hope makes sense later Mm -hmm. you know eventually i can talk about what that is but um yeah so that's the one i'm working at it's been a really slow go there was a time there where um i was barely working on it at all because of some family health stuff uh with my mom um and then it's also like this is the first mouse guard story that i ever really thought up when i was first developing sax and kenzie and rand as characters yeah, I I set them in this big like weasel conflict, this this winter war kind of a thing. Well, when I did the first issue of Mouse Guard One, I certainly wasn't developed enough as a storyteller to be able to tell that story. But also, it was a terrible on ramp for an audience. You know, throwing them in the middle of a war story, I yeah. needed to introduce them to the world. So yeah. I did a very simple story about a routine patrol that then goes slightly askew. So. Now, all these years have passed, and I'm having to tackle this. Well, it's a big story. There's a lot of moving parts to it. There's also the weight of, I've been teasing this story, the anticipation (laughs) that's out there from the fans, but also the anticipation for myself. This is the first Mouse Guard story that I avoided telling because it was going to be too hard. And now I start trying to tell it, and I go, oh my god, this is really hard. This is is still hard. Um... So it's it's a really slow go, but be patient. I'm working on it. Um, That's great. It it is happening. I even sometimes stream bits of it uh, on Twitch while I'm yeah. working. Um, so I've colored some Weasel War pages. I've I've inked some Weasel War pages. Um, it's coming. I, there's no release date. I need to get far enough into the series that the publishing can start up without it being without it ever catching up to me um, and my my creation schedule of of producing it. Um, the role-playing game that you mentioned is out of print at the moment. Um, it was just starting to go out of print before COVID hit. And we knew that, uh, when we, before we reprinted it, there were some things that needed to be corrected, just some errata kind of corrections. And there was a font issue that needed to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unfortunately, the font issue meant that the whole book had to be relayed out. Because as soon as you substitute a font, things start stringing out on (laughs) the extra pages. Yeah. So Luke was in the middle of that uh, and getting that all fixed and then COVID hit and it was like, we don't even know if our overseas printers are equipped. Can we actually get shipments? And so we've only just gotten back on track where enough of that pipeline is now secured where we can we can do that. So the the role playing game is going to be coming back into print 
uh, in the late summer. Uh, right now, I think the projection is August. It will be available again. Great. That's yeah, awesome great. to hear. And then, uh, yeah, other stuff. I mean, I've got the variant. Co- I don't think I'm supposed to say who the variant covers are that I'm working on yet. Okay. Uh, um, oh, hell, why not? Uh, it's Usagi Ujima. <laughs> oh, yes! yes! Oh! No way! Um, so, yeah, I'm working on those covers. Uh, just just kind of started. That just that assignment just kind of came in. Uh, and then when, when COVID hit, uh, the... Emerald City Comic Con uh, was canceled, and that's, that's usually Seattle. my first big convention mm-hmm. of the year. Um, and I'm glad that it was canceled. It was the right move. Um, there was even a question as to whether or not it would be, and I was even then going, I hope they cancel it, because if they don't, I'm going to have to be the bad guy who says, mm-hmm. I'm not going to that. I'm right. not going in the middle of this thing, uh, or at the start of this thing. Um, but what it meant was I had a ton of stuff that I had made to debut at my first big convention of the year. Like, oh. Hey, I'm releasing all my new prints. Hey, we're releasing yeah. new mouse guard t-shirts and we've got these and we've ordered extra this. And I had all that stuff in my house and it's like, I've already paid for it. Yeah. So I decided to do an online streaming event and I called it online con. And I said, basically all the hours that I would be at my table at a convention, I'm going to stream during those. Oh, yeah, that's cool. So I did that and I kind of just used it as an advertisement for, Hey, I've got prints and I've got whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was cool um, to kind of break it up and get a little variety instead of just me taking commissions and drawing them. I said, let's, uh, let's take a break out and let's hop on Skype and let's, let's call one of my friends. And so, yeah, that was cool. uh, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm lucky enough. I'm, I'm friends with some, some talented creators. So we got Jeremy Bastion to come in and, and uh, uh, Nate pride and Katie cook and some mm-hmm. other illustrators that are, you know, friends that I would just normally call throughout the week anyways. So brought some of those people, Corey Godby brought them in, but for the most part, it was just me and a few random <laughs> phone calls. Uh, people really liked it. Yeah. So I said, I think I can do this, but better. Cause that was very impromptu. That was very last minute. Like, and I went, I, w- I don't want it to just be an ad. I don't, that's not what I want to do. I want to, I want to do something more like what we're all missing from conventions. Um, part of that is the interaction, which people are getting from me and then they can type and I can answer. So there's still some of that, but conventions are bigger than me. You know, when you as a fan go to a convention, there's a lot more to see and there's a lot more to do. So I went, let's do a, a, a second online con. We did it back in August where I have... 40 hours blocked out, five, five days, eight hours each, 40 hours blocked out of convention. I'm going to be drawing on the even numbered hours and we're going to have panels in the odd numbered nice. hours. <laughs> oh, wow. And so I bring in guests. And last time I had, uh, I had Meredith Salinger from dream, a little dream and Natty Gann come in and read a brand new mouse guard story that I illustrated for that oh, cool, man. That's event. Cool. That's great. Uh, I had Luke Crane come in and talk about game design. I had a guy from Weta come in and talk about Weta, his, really? uh, now off. Yeah. His, uh, well, his name's uh, Johnny Frazier Allen. He's a former Weta guy. He's now opened up his own company that does tabletop miniature, uh, terrain. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. So cool. Um, and and we talked to him about sculpting. We we had um, uh, I'm blanking on everyone now. We had we had more episodes of the Plot Masters Project. Um, we we had Tony Dieterlizzi, you know, who's famous for having done the the Spiderwick Chronicles, oh, right. and uh, uh, he, he you know he illustrated a lot of the second edition Monster Manual that yeah. I grew up on. Um, we had we had other we had Gabe Rodriguez from Lock and Key yeah. coming all the way in from Chile, uh, you know, via, via these ones and zeros we're all surfing. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, it was it was just it was awesome, and my fans loved it, and so I'm doing another one next month uh, in Great. March. Oh, that's, that's incredible! Awesome. So I can I can promote some of the people that have confirmed. Obviously, life happens, so if last minute changes need to happen, some of these people, you know. But um, Stan Sakai yes. 
has agreed to come in. The the wow, artist who did the Mouse Guard Alphabet oh book, God. Serena Malian, is coming in. Armand Balthazar, who's a, an illustrator who's worked on a lot of animated projects doing backgrounds and design work, um, but he also has his own book series called Timeless. Tracy Butler, a comic artist who does a book, uh, a web comic called Lackadaisy that has anthropomorphic cats. Um, Kevin McTurk, uh, <laughs> uh, practical effect, um, uh, practical effects guy who's worked at Stan Winston. Wow. He's worked, you know, he worked on Jurassic Park three. He worked on uh, X Men First Class. He's now also a, a director of his own puppetry films. Really. Um, and he's going to come in and talk about practical <laughs> effects so cool. and storytelling, his own storytelling. That's right. Um, any of you guys remember Bear from Bear in the Big yep. Blue House? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Noel McNeil was Bear. He's a friend of mine. Noel's going to come in and talk <laughs> really? about performing, uh, doing <laughs> doing puppet performing, being inside of a suit when performing. Um, a friend of mine who's a, a fantastic baker is actually going to come in and do a, a, a baking segment. Yes. Um, That's great. She gets next to <laughs> yeah, and then I've also got confirmation from like Sanford Green and Carl Kershaw, you know, comic mm-hmm. staples. Um, yeah, it's going to be good stuff. When, when in March That's is That's an happening? awesome thing to start, yeah. It's March 24th through 28th. Cool. And my Twitch so channel this will be is, out. Uh, it's, you know, twitch.tv slash David Peterson. And just spell my name correctly where all the vowels in my last name are E's. P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. Fantastic. That's well, incredible. David Peterson. Yeah. Yeah. That's the future. That's amazing. That's a great what a future. future. I love that. I we love you giving that to fans. Oh uh, yeah. Not, not just adapt, but like, you know, roll with the times and bring people together and just yeah. creating this environment, not just through these awesome, you know, images, uh, both outside and inside, but you know, just bringing other people to that, uh, and just, you know, rallying, um, what we call coverdom together, which is really yes. just people and art, uh, sharing ideas, talking, learning um, from each and other, learning more about each yeah. other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's such a cool form of expression. And we just, we appreciate you so much for being yeah. here and, uh, sharing that with us as well. Well, thank you guys for having me. Hopefully we covered it all. Oh. Hey! How long? That How long were you sitting that on that one? Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks for meeting yep. with us. And we don't believe in uh, we don't believe in goodbyes, but we will see you later. Sounds good. See you later. Yes. Very yeah. well. experience yes. folks Ooh. if you just came out of the of the wooded hollow that we just did you are probably not even listening to this anymore you're probably <laughs> at your desk or in your garage and you are working on something because that's right just such a maelstrom of yep. creativity of, of creativity of of good advice that he, he Great gave stories. us so much yes so much insight into you know even just like your portfolio, you know what people yeah. want to hear. If you're if you're an artist who's who's starting out, um, I'm so glad that you were able to be on this journey with us because yes. I know for each of us personally, we all took a lot away from this. Interview. Oh my goodness, it's such an incredible interview, and again, such a generous uh, person. Check out all of his stuff. Check out his website. Oh, yeah. yep. um, check out his YouTube. He's going to be having that Mouse online Guard. Comic Con coming up. Yep. Yes, you guys we are going to be watching that, that That's, for uh, sure. That's March twenty fourth. Um, so much good stuff. And what a great um, mentor. Even even if you haven't met him personally, he's he's this online mentor. He's a teacher. This wizard will show you the way to create something magical with your with your own essence. And the Gornak shall not pass. Oh, the Gornak is smashed oh, right now. He the is, Gornak he is, is minuscule. For a good the Gornak of time. will not be seen around these parts <laughs> for at least three months. Oh, that's right, folks. So yeah, we, we hope you're just, you know, as warm and buzzed as we are. Um yeah. we're just we're 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 head over heels excited. Um Yes. For, for this interview, for David Peterson, all the things he's done, all the things he's going to do. Um, yeah. And if you didn't know who David is, 
like Inks just said, we're super glad you got introduced. Go check out his yeah. work for sure. I mean, we're um, a plucky little podcast trying to decode these covers, and we just got, again, this wizard showed up, responded to our emails, and um, just just dropped so much knowledge for you guys. I, I'm, so, I'm so glad that we could bring this to you. And with that, please, please, if this is your first episode, check out some more of our stuff. Yes. We would absolutely appreciate it. Like, uh, sus- subscribe to us. You can follow us on Instagram at Cover Decoder. Inks and Brengineer both have art up there. It's awesome. Check it out. Oh, thank you. Uh, you can send us yes, any yes. comments that you have um, about the show or covers you found or ideas for episodes. Send us we your love covers. All that stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, please. Covers. We want them. You can hmm. send that to uh, coverdecoder at gmail.com or our Instagram, like we said. If you liked this and you said, you know what? I want to help these boys. I want to give these boys a <laughs> bone. Good boy. We have a Patreon, folks. We have a Patreon right. and we have several awesome patrons. Uh, there are cover cultists. They're with us on these exclusive episodes where we talk about all sorts of super fun, awesome art. Um, and you know, you just get more content and it's just $2 a month and it helps us out a lot with the show. Yes. Absolutely. Join the cult. Yes. Join the cult. It grows strong. And with that, remember, no matter if you're a mouse or a weasel, you get your brush and you hit that easel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>